Howdy, everybody. It's old Cody over here from the Cowboys of the Osage podcast. Hey, today we're not coming from the Ben Johnson Cowboy Museum located in historic downtown Pahuska, Oklahoma. We're on the road. Me and Jimbo. Jimbo, my co-host, the rodeo historian himself. Jimbo, who do we have today and where are we? Hey, Cody. We're in Cole County, Oklahoma at the home of Mr. Pate McIntyre. You know, Pate's a third generation roper. His dad was three-time world champion steer roper, 57, 58, and 61. And a lot of people might not remember, but his grandpa, John McIntyre, was a great old steer roper, a real pioneer in the rodeo business. Uh, he was a world champion in 1934. And Pike followed in their footsteps, a very accomplished roper, two times national finalist. He roped, to, to, uh, he won the Ben Johnson, won Pendleton, won Post Texas, I don't know where all, placed everywhere. And something about him that's hard to believe, he's the only guy I know that could rope, win left-handed, and then switched hands and won right-handed. Now, that's pretty hard to do. And he was also a country music singer, and uh, somebody said he had some sisters that could sing a little bit. But uh, anyway, Pike, thanks for inviting us down today. You're welcome, and y'all welcome to Cole County at Cairo, Oklahoma, halfway between Colgate and Wardville, Oklahoma. I got to tell you a quick story, Jimbo, about the switching hands. Right after I switched over to right-handed after I got off the road with RCA Records in the late 80s, I went to Aspermont to a jackpot out there. And here come Tom Gibson up with this old codger. He said, hey, Pake, I want to introduce you to so-and-so. And I shook hands with this gentleman. And Tom said, you know, old, old Pake here, he's ambidextrous. And this gentleman said, really? What does that mean? He said, he can't rope with either hand. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You could though. That, that's amazing. I just can't imagine right in the middle of your career. Just, I mean, that'd be like Cody. That'd be like me and you just decide to start roping left-handed. No, don't do that. Don't no. do that. I can only pick my nose right-handed. I can't <laughs> even pick my nose left-handed, Jim. I can't imagine. Can you imagine doing no, that? This no. guy took my money with both hands. I know. Isn't that handily? Something? Well, you took my money more than I took yours. <laughs> I don't know about that, Pake. Every time he decided to come out of retirement again, he'd just start taking everybody's money. Then he'd retire again, Jimbo. Right. Or go back on the road singing. Or Well, I was right there next to the fence when he won the Ben Johnson right-handed. Well, thank you. That's been so long ago that it just kind of was in a different life. Yeah. That had been, what was it, 89 or something? Uh, let's see, that would have been in 90. 90. Would have been in 90, yeah. Yeah, and I was still a B roper in the club roping during right. that time. Right. And the next week, uh, they was they had a. That's when they had uh, ropings. You know, the club ropings at the fairgrounds, and me and Rocky was sitting over there that next week, and uh, they'd stopped the roping. They having a meeting over there, and Rocky said, "You know what they're doing, don't you?" I said, what? He said, they're kicking you out of the B roping. <laughs> he said, if I was you, I'd go over there and complain and, and plead my case. I said, well, it's kind of hard to do with that $6,500 they gave me from the Ben Johnson in my pocket. Right. So they call this shut up. <laughs> Pake. What? Let's go all the way back. Let's go all the way back to your grandpa. Okay. Did you ever hear where he kind of got his start with roping? Yes, in 1920, he and Wolf Markham went to a roping near Pittsburgh, kind of in between Kiowa and Pittsburgh. And ironically, they saw their first steer roping there that uh, Jake Weaver put on. And they just pinned these cattle up to the north in this corner and just run them out across the flat there in the grass and tied them down. And they, they kept time with an alarm clock. <laughs> and uh, so... They saw their first airplane there, too. And uh, so they knew that they had to start doing that when they saw them them boys tying them steers down. Did he have a mentor of any kind when he would get started roping, or did he just well, back self-taught? Then, back then, there was it was all outside, no fences. And everybody's cows run together. So he and Wolf... They found, got them some ropes and some tie strings, and they just would go out on these prairies and see these cattle, and they just bail to them and just go to roping them around the neck. It didn't matter. Time down. 
And things didn't turn out very good because they weren't set up for the best arena conditions. Well, one time here come the law with some neighbors complaining about them roping their cows and milk cows and all that stuff. And they snuck out the back and hid their ropes and tie strings. He said, we wasn't bad boys. We just wanted to rope. <laughs> How did he get to the rodeos? I heard that they just you used to ride to a lot of rodeos back then. They did. Uh, back during the 101, when he lived over there by uh, Stonewall, right back over here, a little town called Lula, Oklahoma. Well, he is about 180 or so miles. Well, he would go by Floyd Gales at Oak Mogi and stay all night with him. And then they'd ride together to the 101. He said one time he missed his steer and had his horse tied up over there at the fence. Missed his steer, went out the back, come by and picked up his horse and headed back home. <laughs> That's a pretty good ride from here to the 101. One. Absolutely. That's wanting to rope. He used to look at my little old half-ton pickup with a camper and a side-by-side -side trailer, and he said, Man, if I had a rig like that when I was your age, I'd never come home. Huh. Did he ever put his horses on the trains? Yes. Yes, they did that quite a bit. And uh, any way they could get their old raggedy Model A uh, cars and, and a trailer. One time, Daddy said when his little old kid, uh, Grandpa was getting ready to go to a, a camp roping out at Ardmore, about 85 miles away. And he looked in the trailer floor, and there's a big old hole right there where the horse is going to step, mm -hmm. where he had to stand, bigger than a basketball. <laughs> He said, Pappy, you better put something over that hole. He'll get his foot down. And he said, no, he won't. Well, went over there and roped in the rope, and then he stopped back by Davis, Oklahoma, to eat supper. Pulled in this little old Greasy Spoon Cafe. And when he stopped out there in the parking lot, somehow he'd lost the tailgate off his trailer, and his horse just backed out of the trailer. <laughs> never stuck his foot down in yeah. the hole and never backed out of the trailer and was hauling with no tailgate. Don't, well, you, don't you know seen... those are some pretty fancy trailers back then? <laughs> <laughs> they must have been a smart horse. Both seem like a bad idea. Don't right. step in that hole. Don't back out of that trailer. Yeah, right. he took care of himself, didn't he? Yeah. Very self, very self-proficient that horse was. Where well, all did he go? I mean, how would he have got to Cheyenne? Um, I really don't know, but, you know, he... He would go up to Boston Gardens and Madison Square Garden, and we've got pictures of him and Everett Shaw when they were up in New York rodeoing, and they didn't have a hat. So they didn't have any cowboy hats up there, so they had these little derbies. Well, when they came back down and went to Fort Worth, they were still wearing those derby hats. And that picture in there was the vagrant I was telling you about. Mm -hmm. Well, him and Shaw sitting there with these New York hats on, little derbies, uh, still down here in Fort Worth, Texas, in 33, I think it was. Huh. Were they traveling partners? Yeah. In fact, uh, they went to Pendleton together the first time. Shaw, not everybody knows who you're talking about, even though they should. Uh, you're yeah. talking about Everett Shaw. Everett Shaw. The great, the yes. great roper from around here. From Stonewall. And uh, they went together the first time uh, in the early 30s. And uh, Shaw was pretty young. Grandpap was a little older. And the story goes was that they were getting ready to rope. And they had a rope bag. And uh, they looked in there. Shaw did. And he said, there was only there was rope missing. He said, McIntyre said, where's our other rope? said, Said, we only got one rope. Said, I gave it to that fella over there. Over there, And he said, but McIntyre said, we just had two ropes. He said, yeah, but Shaw, he didn't have one. Yeah. <laughs> I meant Dick Truett was right in the middle of that. Oh, guy. yes. Oh, yes. Dick was one of those underrated steer ropers like we were talking about, your granddad. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Dick was uh, Everett Shaw's brother-in-law, Cody, for those people that don't know. And he was an old-time bulldogger, steer roper, cab roper. Did it all. You bet. That's Nell's brother. Yep. She was a special lady over there. She lived a long time after after Everett Shaw died. And I got to meet her a few times because my dad used to travel with Neil, her grandson. That's right. Neil Worrell. And uh, we'd stop by and, and see old Nell. And she'd always cook Neil up a big old bunch of, bunch of good food in there. It was a good time and a really neat lady to, to oh, get absolutely. to know. Oh, absolutely. Big rodeo cowboy wife that was very supportive. All her family. Yep. 
What all events did your grandpa do when he'd enter those rodeos back back east? Did they have the steer open at Madison Square Garden no. and Boston Garden? No, no, they did not. Uh, but he liked to enter as much as he had entry fees for. And a lot of times he would pick up Bronx for entry fees. And they would sleep in, uh, in horse stalls. And, and they just scrounged and just got there and, and did the best they could. It just depends on what... How, how much money he had to enter with, but he did rope calves, rope steers, bulldog, rode saddle broncs, rode bulls. But he said saddle bronc riding was his favorite event. He said that's the most fun. Did he any, did he win any big championships riding saddle broncs no. at any of the big rodeos? No. And see, he won world championship in 1934. When if you won Cheyenne, you were the world champion. Yeah, there were a few years where Madison Square Garden, if you won, the, won it, it was considered world champion. Then it went to Cheyenne. Then it went uh, to all around until they uh, started keeping track of the money. Uh, I tell you, uh, uh, Clyde Burke, you know, that got killed at Denver Hazen, they said, uh, Tim Prather told me one time that, that he won the Madison Square Garden up there one time. They was interviewing him afterwards, and he said, can you tell us what your greatest accomplishment is in rodeo? He said, yeah, winning the Velma picnic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's the oldest continuous celebration in the state of Oklahoma, Jimbo. Velma I've heard picnic. Of it. never oh, been there. Yeah, it's a big one. They got a good they got a good steer rope in there. A bunch of good folks in that yeah, area. Yeah, I've roped steers there. Don't don't get much better than the Velma picnic, really. <laughs> but that's as big that was that fellow's biggest accomplishment. Yeah, huh? and you know, then people up there kind of roll their eyes a little bit. They didn't know what the Velma picnic was in New York City. <laughs> Boy, that would have been something to be in that rodeo back in those days, though. Did uh, you ever get a go with no, your dad? No, but you know, there was something like 35 and 38 performances of that thing. They'd stay up there a full month. Yeah, and the kids couldn't get to go because it was during the school year. Yeah, you know? they couldn't so stay So I think my dad long. and Joe just got to go once or twice yeah. because it was in October. I can only imagine the some of the shenanigans happen in New York City with all these cowboys. I've been to Pendleton and Cheyenne and, and seen plenty of things happen. I can only imagine. Yeah, it was. You stick pretty, all these cowboys in the middle of New York City. Some they, of the fun things that might have happened. They said they were there so long that those horses would get stall crazy, and said they would they would do it with each other's horses, like have a slicker or something and be hiding and have him ride up to the stall and they jump out and try to scare the horse to keep to try to keep him from being so barn crazy they kept them down underneath i think they had stalls down underneath the i've heard that Madison square garden I've my dad that. once when he was there he said they'd let you in about nine o'clock in the morning and that was his job to go over there and get the horse and exercise him you know yeah you know i heard an old rodeo story from there one time uh, there was an old calf roper, I guess, named Junior Vaughn from out in New Mexico. I guess he was really, really, really good. One of the best calf ropers to ever live. Underrated guy. But he was also a very bad alcoholic. And uh, I guess he was en route to win Madison Square Garden. And they got him drunk and hid his boots from him. And he showed up and they told me he won it barefooted. <laughs> Went and won the calf rope and barefooted at Madison Square Garden because they had stolen his boots. Because they knew that if this guy showed up he was probably going to win it have you ever heard anything like that no but i've heard junior Vaughn stories but the, also about up there you know they had the jerk down rule before it was ever right, down here right. in, the, in the calf roping and they'd take them horses that wouldn't stop so they brought a horse down here to rope at fort worth and bill Lowe had this horse and uh might have been bill murray was going to try to ride borrow this horse to ride him and he said, yeah, you can ride him, but let me tell you something. When you rope this calf and you get over in that stirrup, now you think he ain't going to stop, and sure enough, he won't. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, up there, uh, those calves, they'd buy them in the spring and use them, and then by fall, they were pretty good size, and they were yes. smart, too, most of them. Yeah. And, they'd, and you couldn't jerk them down, and they'd meet you halfway up the rope. Oh, man, that'd be good watching. Jim, Jim, and they had a buzzer. You know, I forget what the buzzer was, but you had a time to time, and it was a long time. Long time. And Jim said some of them bulldoggers, big, tough bulldoggers, would get in the cab open because they were there, and they'd back down the rope, you know, because those calves, they scared of those calves, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they'd hit you right in the chest, some of them. 
It, well, even even down here at Fort Worth, they were big because Daddy said he won the first go round down there one time with a sixteen. Yeah. Oh yeah. Jim rope one around the horns one time. He's a heifer that that nobody won a quarter on, and and he he roped around the horns on purpose where he could handle her and place her around. <laughs> Well, I've seen some pictures of your family roping at Massa Square Garden, and there were some big old calves yep. they were roping there. Yep. That one of uh, your family member that's on the cut on, in Life magazine, yeah, Pat Parker. Yeah, Pat Parker. That's yep. a big old brindle calf he's roping. Big old yep. Bramer calf in that picture. It's a good one. Yep. It's a good one. Did your grandpa ever do much of the wild cow milking back then? I don't know. You know. There was one tale as up there in the northwest when Daddy was a little kid. That grandpa was in the bulldog and and it was during the rodeo, and Daddy told this story. They were all sitting around the fence, and grandpa was underneath this old steer, and he was just spread out in the back end, just stood up, and he wouldn't tilt. I mean, this one went on for a long time, and whoever Daddy was sitting by said, "Hey, Clark, run out there and get him by the tail." So he ran out there and got this big old steer by the tail and tailed him over, and the crowd just roared. Now, that was illegal. He didn't get a tie. Right, but right. It was but good for shit. Got him down on the ground, though, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> what about... Uh, yeah, he had me confused there for one second. Now it's all coming together in my head, Pake. Okay. <laughs> Did I tell that right? Did I, <laughs> well, I, I thought... Okay, I don't know okay. Cody's listening He's thinking day. about the next question. Right. Yeah, I was thinking about something else. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking about something else, Pake. I apologize. That's all right. Gosh, dang, you caught me at a moment of weakness there. <laughs> I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> I stay in trouble with Lauren all the time not paying attention about different things. <laughs> about different things. <laughs> so your grandpa, he'd go to Madison Square Garden. Would he make Pendleton? Oh, yeah. Boston Garden, Pendleton. Um, all those big rodeos. See, they were raised around there. Where we're sitting right here, he's, his mom and daddy raised nine kids right over here within a mile. Now, mama's... Uh, Daddy's mother's family was right over here about a mile. So we're sitting right in the middle of where those two families were, big families. And they were farmers. They would farm these old fields and stuff and just enough to scratch out a cornbread living. Well, Grandpa didn't want that. He wanted to go to Pendleton. He wanted to go to Cheyenne. He wanted to go to Boston Gardens and Madison Square Garden. And he wanted to see things. And he was he had to really buck the odds because the old man wanted to keep him right here and plow them fields and he said, No, I ain't doing that. I'm getting out of here. So he became a rodeo cowboy. That's how a lot of them started, just wanting to get away from the ranch yeah. and wanted to see yeah. the see the sights. Yeah, they didn't want what wasn't backward or nothing. Right. And I think the entertainment deal with Reba, Susie and I and Daddy, you know, handed down from Grandpap's way of thinking, because, you know, to be an entertainer, you got to be on, you got to be on stage. You can't be backwards. You can't be shy. <laughs> you know. Yes, sir. You got to crave that attention. Your grandpa really wanted Clark to be a roper, didn't he? Yes, he told uh, Daddy. He said, Clark, if you're in the practice pen and you look over your shoulder and you see the house is on fire. You just keep on roping. Me and your mom put it out. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that. Did your grandpa ever win Pendleton? No, he won second in the bulldogging there one time, but no, he never did. This table we're sitting on right here around uh, was given to uh, Grandpa and my grandma when they were married in 1924, and it was used then. Oh, we know. This table right here. This thing's seen a lot of action, hadn't it? Oh, yeah. I mean, this is a table where all the champions, all the rodeo cowboys would come in to Limestone Gap and eat at this table right here. Yeah. I was telling Pike, when I was a kid, they always announced Clark from Limestone Gap, Oklahoma. I don't know where that's at, but that, that's where, yeah. you know, he said they don't even have a post office there, but no, it's still, that's where he was from. But I'll, I'll bet money that your granddaddy ate at this table. Probably. Had to have. Had to have. Yeah. If you're a rodeo one back then, you had to yeah. pass yep. through and see yep. what was going on if you're down in this direction. Yeah. But I asked Daddy, he said, Daddy, why do you, how come you eat so fast? He said, well, I was raised up with all them cowboys. If you didn't eat fast, you wouldn't get enough because they'd eat it up. 
How many times did your dad win the world? Three. Again? Three times. Yeah. 57, 58, and 61. Correct. Thank you, rodeo historian. Yeah. And he, 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 he beat Joe, was just lucky enough to beat Joe Snively in 61 by $94. At, that was at, the closest race at that time. Yeah, wasn't it? it was. And, I, you know, we were at Delbert's funeral, and I walked up to Joe and showed him that buckle because that's the one I wanted. Because we were, I went with him that, that summer and, and stuff for me and my cousin and a friend. We stayed gone about six weeks, and uh, Joe knew exactly how all that came about. Even with Clark winning Cheyenne and Joe winning second, and Sonny going out, who was, was seated in first. And Joe told me that all Don McLaughlin had to do in the finals there at Laramie was to catch his last steer to move Clark out of fourth place in the average. But he wrote, missed this steer, and his first loop hung on one horn, and instead of taking it off the saddle horn, he pulled his second one and roped him. And when he went to the end of it, his first rope was shorter and it pulled the second rope off his head and let Clark win fourth in the average to let him win the world. Got something. Well, it's Kurt Robbins to say that's one of the many intangibles of steer roping right yeah. here. And Joe, he remembered that just like as yesterday. Yeah. Both deals. Yeah. Well, you probably would too if... That's what cost you the world championship. You might remember that one run that one guy had that one time. Yeah, sure. and he didn't. Daddy didn't have a very good finals. I think he placed in one go around and won that fourth. But Joe was hot. But see, Daddy won won shy and he won second at Pendleton that year. That was when he was in that picture in there on that steer head. That was on Kelly Corbin's heel fly. Oh, okay. Horse that Earl, Earl Corbin bought that Shaw and and. And I grew trained, and and that's what he wrote at the finals. But Daddy didn't have a good finals, but Joe did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he won the average that year. Yeah, they were neck and neck. Yeah. Them old horses like that, they used to last a lot a lot longer, it seems like, like old heel fly and yeah. a lot of the horses all the way through the maybe the nineties and then Yeah, they didn't they didn't brush them and 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 overfeed them. They rode them and used them. There that's yeah. where the good horses were. Yeah. And Ike was big on that. Ike, I said, Daddy, how, how did Ike Root have so many good horses? Was he a great horse trainer? He said, no, he just used them. Yeah. He used them. He had 12 guys on old bullet at, at Pendleton one time. Holy moly. Yeah. Well, that guy was a, a rodeo cowboy to the core, wasn't he? Hey, uh, me and him won a team roping one time. He was seven. He, I was fourteen, and he was seventy-four. There was sixty years difference in our age. I wish I'd kept that belt buckle, but I lost it. Hmm. As at Buffalo, was that a dally team roping or was it a tie down team? Well, roping? they let him tie on because he was healing, and I was turning them left-handed this way, and he could run in there and rope. He said, "If you can rope, you can rope with a clothesline." But, and you know, he wasn't used to cattle going that way. But he'd run in there and you know, at least get one foot. We won it. Take, uh, every time we interview somebody that's old enough to remember Sonny Davis, I always have to ask them, what would Sonny Davis tie these calf steers in today? Uh, you know, it's funny about world champions and winners. You know, they'll adjust to win. I don't care if they're roping elephants or day old baby calves. They're going to, people like Shoat and Sonny and Don and Olin, they're going to adjust to win. And Jim Snively and Joe Snively, they're going to adjust. I don't care what it is. It's kind of like they say, oh, they're going to divide all the money up in the United States. Well, in 10 years, the successful people will have it all again. Well, Sonny, Sonny was way before his time. Walter Arnold told me one time that at Lubbock in the slack that uh, he threw his hands up and the, the, the secretary was calling out the times. He said, she said, eight, six. He said, wind the watches. <laughs> Sonny was very funny. Yeah, I loved that guy. He had a high pitched voice. Seemed very like high. that. Uh, I remember he was a great big great. old fella. He was just so big and athletic, and his motor. He just didn't have any slowdown in him. He did. If he was leading the roping by twenty seconds, he's gonna go for the downs on that. Yeah, and he 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 roped that way. Yeah, it's just way. Yeah, he he. I seen him try to safe up and go out numerous times. You know, we all have. And uh, 
But one time at San Angelo, when they had roping fiesta in a little narrow box, we was all back there watching the get out, and here comes Sonny and old Remus. Old Remus' head is that big. He said, wouldn't you like to have his head full of nickels? <laughs> and uh, he got in there, and old Remus got to jumping around. He said, he said, he said, watch his ass, boys, I got his head. <laughs> And down there another time, I, I come up to him after I'd rope, and I said, Sonny, I want to ask you something. Of course, I'd known him since I was a little old kid. And uh, he, what is it? I said, I didn't have a wraparound on all three legs. Should I go tell that flagger? He said, heck no. Said, said they'll cheat you one of these days. <laughs> <laughs> now that's a nice version of the way you would right, probably say right, it. Right. <laughs> yeah, an old guy told me one time uh, on a deal about like that. He said you'll win a few, lose a few, they'll give you a few, and they're definitely gonna get you on a few. So yes. just keep that in mind. Yes, it'll it'll average out. And they didn't say it just like that yeah. either, but yeah, you get the point. Yes, I think our listeners will get the point also. You know, growing up in the rodeo world like you did. What's some of your early memories about traveling with your with your family to the rodeos like Cheyenne and some of the others? Well, one thing is they stayed in them old cheap hotels. And like Daddy always said, if they ever if the, the guy at the front desk ever went to counting heads then we just drove on, <laughs> you know, because it's two or three dollars. Oh, yeah, it was the and, same way for us. We Yeah, in an old ceiling only two fan, people in here. no air conditioner, and we stayed at the Edwards Hotel there in downtown Cheyenne. And the old Edwards, uh, the people who owned that hotel, they reserved it for mainly Okies because, you know, we didn't tear up nothing. And they didn't want the riffraff, they call it, you know, in there during that week. And <laughs> we're, we're talking about Okies here? Yeah. Well, okay. no. I believe but, you. But they like, they like the rodeo cowboys from Oklahoma. And uh, I never will forget when uh, Reba tells this story a lot. They had this kind of a, like a drugstore floor there in the lobby of this place, of this old hotel. And nobody had any money to go to the night show or go downtown or spend money. So everybody sat around in the lobby telling stories, you know, visiting with each other. Well, one time, it got deathly quiet. Everybody just quit talking. I looked, and Ike was while he was walking through the door, drunker than a skunk. It was deathly quiet. He just walked right up through the middle of me. He walked up the stairs. As soon as he got upstairs, everybody went back talking again. <laughs> and that is where... Uh, they started, wanted me and Reba to sing, and I, one of us sang, you ain't nothing but a hound dog, and the other one sang, Jesus loved me, and they pitched quarters or nickels or pennies, whatever it was, on the floor to us. And I guess that was probably our first paying gig. Yep. Yeah. At the Edwards Hotel. Edwards Hotel. Cheyenne, Cheyenne Wyoming, Wyoming during Frontier Days. Yes, sir. You know, that'd be a great first gig and a great last gig, honestly. Yeah, it would. And, you know... Um, we were there this summer, and I, I showed Tommy where that old hotel set and everything, and and I went in that old Western store where uh, Cotton Merritt, Dean Merritt owned there at one time, and and this girl was talking about the ghost inside of it, and uh, said, "You want to see something strange?" And I said, "Always," <laughs> and so come back here, right in this corner. There was a cap sitting there that would move. I said, is there something under it? Pick it up and look at it. It was just sitting on a frame, but that thing was moving like that. And there was no air blowing it, no nothing. I said it does it all the time. Hmm. Is that strange or what? Sounds strange to me, <laughs> babe. <laughs> I've been in that Western store. I, I never knew about the cap. Yeah, Crazy. me either. Have y'all ever seen a ghost? Probably not. Not sure, Pake. Probably I've, not. I've only seen one. It's a short story. You want to hear it? Well, yeah. You started this story. Let's get it going. <laughs> All right. We had a place over here, 6,500 acres. Well, there's actually 12,000 acres of it that the Hunt Brothers that cornered the silver market, you know, back mm -hmm. in the... Okay. They owned this. And we were going over there. We'd pinned some bulls up the evening before, and we was going to cut them the next morning. Well, there's a boy living in that house, and he was going to have somebody help us cut these bulls the next morning. I go by there and pick him up, 
and we go to this barn, put some hay on this truck, go out in this hay mid and feed these cattle. As we were coming back toward the house, there were some cattle off to the right in a separate pasture coming toward us. There was a guy like in a 1940-something hat, a brown khaki jacket with khaki breeches with a stick in his hand, poking at the ground, walking along with these cattle. So I asked my, my friend there, I said, is that the guy that's going to help us today? And he said, where? And we looked back over there and he was gone. We go to the house and there's a fat kid with a t-shirt come out of the house. Never seen one before, never seen one since. What about aliens? No. Nope. <laughs> no. Nope. Never seen one of them either. All your late night drives? No. Nope. No. Nope. I believe you. I was just asking you about the yeah. aliens. And I've heard truck drivers seen little green men dancing on the dash, but not never seen nothing like that. That could be that uh, trucker speed kicking could in be. after a few could days be. of driving. I believe that. your ghost story. I mean, I, I don't say I don't believe in ghosts or do, but I, I'm open-minded about it for sure. I am too, Jimbo. I just hope I don't ever see one. Well, That's what I'm hoping. We but, went through that haunted mansion at Disney World last year. That's all I needed. That's all I needed. You get spooked. Oh, yeah. Hell. <laughs> Scared of snakes, sharks, and ghosts. And your mother. You know. And my mom. And your mom. Oh, She's yeah, mean. She's a mean booger. Uh, I've seen her mad. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. You know, you know what I, I would add to that? Rats. I don't like them. I don't either. If they would just slow down, I'd be all right with them. Those things can chew about through anything. Oh, I hate them. Hey. I've been in some old farmhouses and stuff and seen where they chewed literally through the wall into another room to oh, see what was yeah, in there. Yeah, that's right. Well, let's get back to talking about rodeo. You got it. <laughs> Heck with the rats and aliens and ghosts. Yeah. So, <laughs> what would you do when you were a kid, like up at Cheyenne, but when you wasn't getting your first music going? Did you guys hit the carnival? Did you watch the rodeo all day? What? Did you rope the dummy like we did behind the stands? Yes. I remember vividly in 1961 when I was eight that we were back behind the stands and you know people like Charlie Lynn and Jim Davis and Ab Deacons and a lot of other kids. Houston Evans kid. Can't remember his name. But we'd be back there roping and everything and they called Clark McIntyre in the short go. I didn't know what he would win in setting. I just run around there, stuck my fingers through that chain link fence. I remember know, it. Right? Watched him rope. He run one way off down there at the camera pit. And, okay, tied him down. I run back there. I didn't know he won it. But it was strange. He had priced that little horse called Redwood before the rodeo for $1,500. Now, you think, well, that's kind of cheap. Well, it took $3,400 or $3,500 to win the world back then. See? Well, that's half of what you would win. Like if they win 100000 nowadays. That's half of a year. Yeah, that's like saying, okay, I'm going to price my horse for 50000 A lot of guys would do that. Well, this little old horse was kind of crazy. And you couldn't ride him in the box if anybody was standing around or inside of it or up on the back of the box. He had to lead him in there, put him in the corner, and then get on him. Hmm. Well, this guy said, I want to see how he does before I buy him. Well, we slept in the horse stall the whole week there, me and Daddy, Gary Thompson and Mike Miller, local boys. They were like 15 and 13. I was eight. We broke like three bales of straw, put some blankets on top of it, and stayed the whole week in the stalls, them old wooden stalls oh, there. I bet that was them? a good time, wasn't it? Oh, man. Them old horses pawed the stalls all night long, but long toward the end of the week, you got used to it. But the best part about it, everybody would come and feed their horse twice a day and then come by and visit us. We got more visiting than anybody. Well, you were talking to all those big guys, too, you yeah. know, everybody, anybody who's anybody, the golden age of rodeo, you're sitting right there just BSing with them all day, a lot every has, day. A lot has happened in, in around those stalls, like in the 70s. One time I was riding my horse by there and saw Dean Oliver crawling out of the back of a station wagon. I said, Dean, what? What's the deal? There wasn't any rooms downtown or nothing. He said, well, yeah, but they wanted $35, and I wasn't going to give that. <laughs> yeah. 
I could tell you a few stories around them stalls, but they would kick us off of YouTube and Facebook, so yeah. I'm not going to say them. Well, the being around the rodeo, there's a lot more fun there than there actually is to watch the rodeo. But I was up there this year, and i got to say they had a really good rodeo this year. I enjoyed it. Yeah, I haven't been up there in uh, five or six years. Yeah. They've changed a lot in the last five it, or six years. It sure years. has, ain't it? I'll tell you, those girls riding them saddle broncs, I mean, they just get piled right, driven right into that dirt and get up looking for their hat. Yeah. They had women's bronc riding this year. Yeah. yeah. Holy moly. Yeah, and they had boys steer riding, yeah. riding them eight-weight steers. Oh, and wow. they had the rookie bronc riding, but they used to call that the amateur bronc riding. Yeah. Now it's called the rookie. And it's know, been called the rookie for quite some okay, time. Okay, but I mean, back in the day, it yeah. was the amateur. And boy, they, would, they wouldn't wait. I mean, as soon as a pickup yeah. guy's got him off, here come another one. That's the way all of them ought to be. Oh, yeah. It's definitely a Wild West show. Yeah. It's, it's good watching. One of the last Wild West shows out there. And Cheyenne the Wild Wild Horse Race. They brought it back. Yeah. Yeah, they were having it for a while. My dad was telling me that, and you might have heard this story, but they'd always get some horses loose, and they'd come back in the arena and back and forth, and Shoke would forefoot them with that old steel horse, <laughs> and they'd just end on them. He thought that was, you know... And and they made him told him warned him several times not to do that, and he kept doing. It. They said if you come if you do that again, you're not coming back to Cheyenne. <laughs> <laughs> but, One time we was on the racetrack on that south end, and and uh, what with this uh, this saddle bronc rider, his horse jumped the camera pit down there on that corner, you know, and uh, well here he comes south, and I looked and saw him, and I jumped off and cinched up. Well, I I took off running, and here he come right up the side of me. And I never had picked up anybody riding a right. fucking horse before, but his horse was running away. And I said, you want off? And he said, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I said, well, get a, get a hold. I didn't think about getting a buck rein. I didn't care about the horse, but I got the guy off. Do you remember your first time you ever roped at Cheyenne? 71. Yeah, I was, I graduated that May and I uh, got to rope at Pendleton and Cheyenne both that year, the first year, 71. Pike, when you were young, roping the bales of hay or the steer heads or whatever, did your grandpa or dad ever try to get you to rope right-handed? You know, I asked Randy Burchett this about six months before he died. I said, Randy, you've known me all my life. I said, oh yeah. I was around Everett Shaw, Clark McIntyre, John McIntyre, Don McLaughlin, uh, Sonny Davis, Olin Young, all of those past world champions, Jim Snively, not one of those guys ever hinted to me that I needed to rope right-handed. Should have broke your arm, and your so left one. I did. That's another story. And so Randy said, why no, they didn't want you beating them. <laughs> <laughs> He ropes horns just as good as anybody anywhere with that left hand, Jimbo. Well, yeah. And well, just cracks that's a, a knot natural, off That's a natural hand. I know. It's just uh, well, yeah, it's amazing to watch him. See, about two weeks before I started in the first grade at Limestone Gap, I broke my arm riding calves in two places between my elbow and my wrist. And they put it in a cast all the way to my armpit. Well, when I went to school, they put me to writing right-handed because I couldn't write with a cast. And that's why I write so terrible nowadays, even today. But the worst thing that ever happened to me was ever winning a dime left-handed. And I told Tim Prather this the other day. You know, Jim put on those great ropings down there at Post for 10 years. And he said, he said, why, why do you say that? I said, because if I'd never won anything, I'd change sooner. Yep. Think about it. But I thought I could beat anybody when they let me win post twice. Yep. You know, 72 and 74. And ironically, Daddy won it in 71. But 25-foot score, the cattle weighed 770-some pounds. Tim thought they weighed eight, but I remember 775. But they were huge. And I rode a little old horse weighing 900 pounds that we bought from Jed Rowe over here at Ada. We lined up across there with that introduction across there. I thought I felt like I was standing on the ground. This little horse was so small. Sandy pin, 25 foot score. I thought, I hope I don't get killed. 
you ever go to that roping, Jimbo? No, never was. Post Texas, what? No. OS Ranch roping and art, OS. art show and sale. That's right. It That's was right. one of the biggest ones of its time. Yep. I met Festus there, Ken Curtis. Oh, okay. Yeah, he would have celebrities come and just walk around. Well, old Festus was there in his get up and his hat and his vest and his, his high top boots and all that stuff. And I, how how are you doing? I wasn't a big Gunsmoke fan then like I am now. I'm right. But, and I thought he was kind of silly and talk with a twang like we did. <laughs> but, and we shook hands and everything, a little short guy, but, and I was trying, I was thinking about winning something. I wasn't big on celebrities and stuff. Huh. And Johnny Gimbel was down there and he played in a band and now I play fiddle. That's my hobby because I can't ride a horse anymore, but. You know, I wish that I'd paid more attention to people like that then. But I was trying to win something. Sure, sure. And you did. Well, they let me. And and I like to say let because somebody has to have hell before you can win something. Think about that. You don't really beat anybody. You do the best you can do and you have a given day. But somebody has to have trouble before you're going to win something. Maybe. Maybe. Or... You were just the best roper that day, Pake. You ever thought of that? Well, I, I, Guy, you know, I've seen him win four go-rounds in a row in two different places. Once at Fitztown over here by Stonewall, another Tucumcari one time. And he's the most remarkable guy I've ever seen. And he told me one time when he had roped just like a perfect roping like that, he said, you know, the worst thing about this is, I said, what? He said, having to go back to the practice pen tomorrow with nothing to work on. <laughs> now, he wasn't bragging. Mm -hmm. He was he was dreading it, but he was going to go anyway. Not many people would go to the practice pen the next day after winning all four go-rounds. Right. Pate practice is a little different than a lot of guys, too. I, uh, I only practiced with him, I think, one or two times ever and i i lived down here in this country and i didn't go to his house i think he came to our house but we laid a steer down to tie <clears throat> we all naturally wanted to get out the stopwatch and see who was the fastest well pay he played a game called uh no stall no pauses no pause yeah no pauses yeah see i learned this from tom ferguson roping calves he said don't ever take a stopwatch to the roping pen he said, just do fundamentals and go a little bit slower because when you get there to the competition, your adrenaline's going to step you up one step faster. So leave enough room for that. So I got along better with pauses and tried to, tried to slow down and be faster than it was to try to be real fast. How many times you heard that in your life? Slow down, be fast. Be fast, yeah. Just the truth. Jim, you say you're tied a lot more steers taking your time and you ever will trying to be fast oh absolutely heard him say that the first i roped in the last time that they had that rope in it out there at clovis new mexico in that old big pen okay and i went out there with daddy and jed row and i tied them all down and uh, but i didn't win anything i was a couple of holes out of the average and shote come up to me and he said well you didn't win nothing but at least you tied them all down well to me Show saw me rope. I didn't think he's even watching, but that was that was as good as winning something. Yeah, for sure. What year did you make the finals? Uh, Seventy four to eighty two. Oh, while we're on show, I got to tell you this. Let's hear that. I told this at Shirley Webster's funeral the other day up there at Nowada about a week ago. Show and I was sitting on the tailgate of a pickup in in the parking lot there at Cheyenne. I said, Shoat, how many times did you win this rodeo? And he said, only six. I said, why do you say only six? He said, well, I was at this damn thing 25 times. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they said that he made the national finals several times, and if it was very far away, he, he might go. not even go. Yeah, he wouldn't go. He wouldn't right. even go. It didn't use pay like it does now, though. Did no. you know, go now. Did y'all know I was at the first national final steer open? No, I did was not two. know that. Was you there? Yeah, I was just three. Okay, I was, that was in 59, I was six. Yep. You was born in 56? Yeah. Okay. You remember how cold it was? No, well, I don't remember, but I know the story. Okay. His dad yeah. ran the shoot. 
Well, see, Daddy was going to, he made it, and we were out there, but he was down in his back, and he didn't get the rope. Yeah. But I, me and Mama never got out of the car. Right. But I could see all of these ropers, and they didn't have hats on. They had them button-down caps with ear flaps on them. Oh, the wind was just blowing ferociously and cold and just miserable on everybody. So they said, me and Mama never got out of the car. Well, my dad ran the chute for the team roping and the steer roping, and then he'd go get in the car during the barrel racing, you know, and warm up. So he was probably the coldest guy there. I had to sit there on that chute. Oh, and, oh, wouldn't you hate to have that job? Yeah. I'd rather been untie my man. Yeah. Daddy was the director, steer roping director that year. And when they was voting to have the national finals rodeo, they wasn't going to inv- in, in, involve team ropers and, and steer ropers. And so, well, give us money, we'll have it somewhere else. No, we're not even going to do that. So they got in a battle over it, Daddy said. So he said, well, all right, then we won't take your insurance. We don't need insurance like you bronc riders do and bull riders do. Well... This lawyer was sitting and said, boys, you need that membership in there to keep your premiums down because they don't get hurt. So he said, Dave, he's got you there. I said, all right, we'll give you $5,000. I think it was 5000 to go have it at Clayton. Hmm. That's how it you came know, about. They didn't give a belt buckle either. And I just now, you know, Jim won it. And and uh, I just a couple of years ago got a belt buckle out of him. I mean, I had to pay for it, but they give me a discount and, and the whole deal. I made it just like the... They were supposed to look back then, you know. Good. It's in the Cody's Museum right now. Wow, good for you. Good for your family. It's really neat. Yeah, his family has a real deep rooted with that first national finals. His dad won the average. Joe made uh, it. Jim won the average. Yeah, yeah your granddad yeah. won granddad. the average. Yeah, yeah. Joe made it, and his dad was 16th and ended up working the shoot. So, so how old was Joe then? He'd have been 17, I think. He or was, 18, maybe 18. He was, when his younger age, he was so fun to watch. So fun to watch. Didn't you think? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've been told, too, you know, how, yeah. how tough he was. Yeah, he was. He, he You know, when Sonny Davis and him and and Shote and Shaw and, and Troy Ford and Jim Snively, when they rode in there, everybody looked up. Just like they said when Dean Oliver was, was in his heyday. In the slack, everybody be talking, but when he rode in the box, it got deathly quiet. Everybody looked up. Yeah. Practicing over here. How big of a practice pen did y'all have? It was 17 acres. There was a, a, a pond in it. It was a hay barn in it. And it was plowed up on one, one part of it. And it was grass down there, the most of it. So if you want to get ready for Pendleton, you just tracked him on down there and tied him down on the grass. So it sounds like you just roped him out in the middle of an open pasture with a little bit of a... It was, the but the pecan trees bar- were down at the back end. They took the, the pecan trees out uh, in the middle of it uh, before I started roping. Yeah. My dad said he came down here as a kid to a jackpot or something at, at their house or at that arena and there was a big tree right out in the middle of the arena. Yeah, Might right. keep your horse from ducking right there. Oh, yeah, yeah, you gotta watch. You gotta either run him past it or rope him pretty soon. <laughs> Don't go away with me because I like posing it. <laughs> but now the highway goes right through it. 69 highway goes right, right through it. Yeah. Huh. The old hay barn's still there. And uh, you can you can kind of tell where it was. That's just wild. So the roping yeah. arena had the hay barn, a pond, pecan trees, a little bit of it plowed up. And grass. Mo- and mostly mostly grass. grass. Yeah. See, the first, me and Don Smith, my, my cousin, his daddy and my mama were brother and sisters. And we were getting ready to go to Sonny Waltman's at Nowata for a first steer roping. And I roped both of my steers, but he run right down the right fence, and I tracked him all the way to the back end didn't get to tell either one of them now that should have told me right then i'm roping with the wrong hand wrong hand i mean this ain't rocket science right <laughs> you think any idiot would have figured that out but no not me it felt good in that hand well, it was like me trying to talk kenyon burns and out of roping left-handed he was left-handed Lionel come to me at Guyman. He said, hey, I need your help. I said, what can I do? He said, 
Phil Hines talked to that kid. I've talked to that kid. Guys talked to that kid. He will not quit roping left-handed. So, where is he? He's out there roping a dummy left-handed. <laughs> I said, we got to get him out of that. So I went out there and talked to him. And so after that, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. He quit roping left-handed and made the finals right-handed. Still ropes right-handed today. Speaking of Kenyon, were you there at Cheyenne uh, that year? He was riding his horse on the, on the track with a halter on him, bareback? No. Well, his horse took off with him, Jimbo. Zero control, and um, it was they were getting ready for a big concert, George Strait. It was one of the biggest concerts they've ever had at Cheyenne. And their stage was a little bigger than normal, and they had a great big two-by-four <laughs> like clothesline looking deal it hits you about right here if you're walking under it on foot and his horse decided to go between all that with him on top of him and the halter on the track at cheyenne at a high rate of speed and uh kenya started going underneath all them deals and he came back on the other side unscathed is the crazy <laughs> it was the craziest thing it'd be like your horse running through the strip and shoot with you on him wow. in a in a roping before i roped up there at cheyenne in 58, Daddy won it on Hugh Posey's little horse called Dunny, a little low-made calf horse. And they, back then, you know, they roped calves and steers both on those horses. And so anyway, they were back behind the chutes, and they had them big old long highline poles, big old things there. And they were just going to tie onto this thing and, and stand this little horse out on the end of it just to kind of get him to stand out on the end of it. He was that green. And said you, Daddy said you couldn't log him at all. He would just go crazy. So but that's all he was wanting to do. Suppose he was sitting on this little horse and with a nylon rope. And Daddy said, Posey, whatever you do, don't get off of him. He said, oh, he'll be all right. I said, Posey, don't get off of him. He got off of him, and that little horse took off. And back then, you know, they used to have these blinds around these outhouses, you know, to keep people from, you had to walk around it and go in. Well, this little pony run off with this huge highline high pole and hung the corner of that blind <laughs> and tore it down and went to dragging it down the side of this racetrack with people. And the only thing that saved, keep from killing somebody, was it cut the rope. And that pony run all the way to the other end. Of that big old pin. That could have been a major that wreck. That could have been awful. I saw a guy one time. It was at our house right over here. We were having a big steer roping, and there was a fella by the name of a Joel Saul, I think, from northern Texas that came up. And uh, he roped this steer, and it came off his. It came off the steer's head as he's stepping down. I don't know if he only had one horn or horn broke. I don't know. But the horn wraps, the rope, everything came off of the steer and wrapped around Joe's legs. And you know, we had a pretty big arena. It wasn't 17 yes. acres by any means, but it was a it's big nice big arena. Good one. And uh, that rope started dragging along the fence and it was fixing to suck Joe underneath the fence. Oh. And it was gonna be a very, very bad situation when it all came tight. And that rope cut right on the fence right before it all came tight. It doesn't it take much of a cut to break a rope. Yeah. I've only broke one roping and it was at Cheyenne and it put my horse's right eye out when it came back at us. Ooh, it'll do it. But if it was, a, if it was an eye to go out, that was a good one to go out on a steer horse anyway. I gotta tell you a story about, if y'all don't mind, about a roping fiesta story. I had a, a green horse that uh, wouldn't get along very good with him all summer, but we wind up going to roping fiesta at San Angelo and we built a new house up there at Pittsburgh. And I had a guy dig my rural water line is going to cost five thousand dollars and i said i said i'm going to have long one i'm going to have to owe you this and he said okay we'll do it don't worry about it so i went in set and second in the short go and just tied them down didn't place in either rounds and the guy in front of me went out but tuffy went in third he passed me but i still won second and I won $5,300 by winning second, which paid for my water line. Well, there was a lady, Katie, my first wife, was 
sitting on the hood of, of her truck up next to the fence on that east side. And this lady was parked there, and every time I'd tie one down, she would just jump up and cheer. And so finally when I tied that last one down, uh, Katie said, what, what is it? Why are you cheering for him? said, I bought him in the Calcutta because he was the cheapest one sold. <laughs> and, and she won $18,000. First time she'd ever played it. She just wanted to play it. A lot of times they come give you 10% or 25% of that Calcutta. And she didn't know anything about that. Gosh, <laughs> newbies. But I was proud enough. I hadn't won that much, I hadn't won that much all summer long on that green pony. Yep, my... Uh... My dad went down there one time, and some Calcutta people called and asked how he'd been roping. And my mom said, oh, don't buy him. He ain't been roping. He ain't been practicing. And he wasn't even roping that good when he quit practicing this year. <laughs> and I'll be danged. To, he went down there and won it. And those those folks called back mad at her. <laughs> well, this year they let me win the Ben Johnson we was talking about. Autumn and Clamity were little, and they was hot. Oh, you you couldn't get a breath of air, and everybody just standing around sweating. And so they found a motorhome to get in where it was cool. Well, they looked through the windows and saw it was breaking up, knowing it was over. And somebody walked by and said, "Hey, girls, your daddy just just won the steer rope." And Clamity says, "Huh." <laughs> <laughs> That's quite the name, Calamity. Yeah. I've I'm, always liked that name. I wanted to name her Calamity Jane, but uh, my wife talked me out of that, so we called her Calamity Joe. <laughs> Just as good, dang uh, near. Well, kind of. <laughs> that Calamity, that's, she was a, she was always a, kind of your wild one of your bunch, wasn't yeah, she? Yeah, she was, she was one that uh, would come and ask me stuff when the other two wouldn't. You know, so you go ask him. No, you ask him. No, Clamity, you ask him. He likes you better. <laughs> I like all of them. They were great girls growing up. Great girls growing up. Everybody always thought anyway. So, you know, they held the NFR steer open portion right down here in McAllister a couple of years. Right. Were you in on that? Or no. Now, go to watch that, it or anything? That, oh, yes, I'd go watch it. And Daddy actually flagged it one time. He didn't make it one year, and there were several years he didn't make it, but that year in particular, he flagged it. Um, you know, it's been in a lot of places. Clayton, New Mexico. It's been in Venita, Pawhuska. It's um, uh, been in McAllister. Hobbs. Hobbs, Hobbs New Mexico. D Amarillo, Douglas, Wyoming. Douglas, Wyoming. Yeah. Mulvane, Kansas. Yeah, Mulvane. Um, Pecos. Did Pecos. you say Pecos? Yeah, Pecos. Yeah, Daddy was there in 67, I think. In fact, that statue, that was a picture, that statue was made off the picture there at the finals in Pecos. Really? Yeah. But yeah, it's, I don't know, it's just awful hard to get people to come out and watch it, but, you know, it is so much fun, and I've, I, I probably have had more fun practicing than I have going because I get to run more head that way. I bought, one, one time in, in the, the fall of 1981, I bought 198 practice steers and had three horses. And I roped them, they were natives, didn't tip them, didn't wrap them, didn't rebar them, nothing. If I broke a horn, I just smooth-headed them, you know, and made stalkers out of them. Well, that, that spring, I put 800 more cattle with them up at Cassidy, Kansas. And we went up there and stayed in a bar because there was no motel rooms. And a man by the name of Carl Grunder had a propane company up there, and he owned this bar. And it had three rooms in it. And But the bar wasn't open, Cody, until Saturday night, the weekend. And so all the locals would come into our house on a weekend. And we stayed up there a full month from April 1st to May 1st. And then come May 1st, we run all these cattle through this long chute, thousand head of them, and gave them that injectable tramazole that we used to have on backpacks. And we drove them out with Larry Nelson. He was gonna look after them all summer. And we drove them out in them pastures just at dark. And they had burned those pastures in the Flint Hills and that grass was up about that big. And you talk about some tired horses at the end of the day. 
Then things would spread out across there. We just kept trying to throw them in the herd. And, uh, but that was, that was really fun. But I'd go play music shows and come back. And, and I, that was last year, I made the finals on those, those horses. Because I just backed in there and tied them down. This one black horse that just a, just a common, common, cold-blooded ranch horse. Thin neck, no tail, big-footed. I didn't break away on him. I didn't log him. I didn't do nothing. I had a jerk line on him and a, and a switch in my belt and just went to tying him down on him. And he turned out to be the best horse. Ain't that the way it usually goes, seems yeah. like? I went second on him and Angelo made the finals on him, won, won Pendleton on him. And you just, uh, you could be down there and have a steer kicking your pockets off. You could cluck to him, he'd step up and he'd say, whoa, and he'd stop. Hmm. You know, it, it just, it just using him. He's the first one I tied on and the last one I tied on because I didn't care if he made a good horse or not. But he wound up being a good horse. Survival of the fittest, and it worked out for him. Yeah. It did work out for him. I'm going to have to use that one of these days. Hey, sweetie, they didn't have any motel rooms. I'm going to have to stay in this bar for a couple days, all right? <laughs> <laughs> but I, didn't, did. I, didn't, I didn't stay all night in that bar. They didn't have any motel rooms. Yeah. And that's the only place there was to he, stay. Uh, he told us, he said, now, guys, there's, there's Subway sandwiches in the ice box. Help yourself to the beer, but don't forget to put money in the cash register. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the rent was ten dollars a day. Playing instruments. You told us about your first gig. Were you already playing instruments at that time? No, I didn't start playing round hole guitar till I was in eighth grade. And Mr. Clark Ryan was was teaching me. And see, we already could sing a little bit from Mama teaching us three part harmony in the back seat of a car going down rodeo and or going to school because she was a school secretary and so we rode with her um i'd get my clothes i'd go out and feed the horses and saddle up a horse while they was eating and now this is a winter time summertime we got to rodeo because the cattle were out on the grass but the winter time was a lot of work down there we had a lot to do with very little things to do with no four-wheel drive trucks no ram bells all everything real hard and daddy didn't have much help. So I'd, I'd saddle up a horse and run in there and eat breakfast and, and while the horse is finished up eating, and then run out there and saddle him and go to pushing cattle up to the feed troughs. Well, then when mom and the girls would get ready, they'd honk the horn and come around the house and I'd run the, lope the horse back to the yard fence, tie him up and get in the car and go to school. Well, that's just the way it was around there. And, but as far as playing an instrument, we had a country music band class in high school. Got a grade for it, for it, you know, had floating subjects, and you had a subject four days a week, not five. And so there was eight of us in the class, and who wouldn't rather be playing country music in the middle of school than have <laughs> to go to science or English class? And we were the heroes of the school. We played for everything the school needed a band for, like a marching band would, like football games, pep rallies, basketball games. You name it, we were the country music. We were the school's band class, and it was really fun. There was one kid in there that was kin by marriage to us, and he come to school strum strumming this old electric guitar, and he didn't know but a few chords and didn't sing wouldn't bashful wouldn't talk to you and so anyway we needed a bass player because mr ryan our teacher was the bass player and that didn't make sense because it's a kid band well after a couple of weeks he just put roger to play him this bass guitar showed him a few notes on it way we went to my knowledge roger to this day has never earned any other income other than playing electric bass guitar and he has played for Alan Jackson for the last 30 years. Wow. One of your schoolmates? Yes. True story. Well, that's something else. Yeah. That is. was really something else. A lot of success. Did, did your sisters join the country music class or was it just... Oh, yeah. Yeah, Reba and Susie. 
Well, okay. it has to be the most success, successful music program from a high school in history. Yeah. Period. You know what was Bar bad? none. Especially one that size. Yeah. yeah. Cody, you know what's bad about it, though? Here's the downfall of it. The teacher, Mr. Clark, right? We had so much talent. See, everybody in that class made their living sometime or the other playing country music. Well, when we all graduated, here come these other little kids with not as much talent. And he said, no, they don't have enough talent. We're going to close the class down. <laughs> well, y'all blew the doors off the yeah, deal. Yeah, I mean, I mean, who goes into a science class knowing that you're going to be a scientist? Somehow? Well, they're all going to be yeah. Albert Einstein coming out of the dang deal. They're yeah. like that deal. Yeah, see, you know, so we're all in there to learn. But he had, we had spoiled him so much, he didn't have to teach us. He just had to keep us from fussing and fighting. That's <laughs> had all. to keep the band together. Yeah, that's it. He had to tell us right in the middle one day, he said, look, how many of y'all have had a call from Nashville lately? I said, nobody. Well, you're acting like it. <laughs> now quit acting that way. Now quit, now get along. So, true story. Hmm. But that's the worst part of it. They closed the class after we all left. <laughs> you just set the bar too high. Had too high of standards. Yeah, but they, it shouldn't have. They shouldn't no. let them little old kids. And even if you help one, because who knows? Who knew Roger Wills was going to play for Alan Jackson for 30 years right. with his talent? That's something else. But he wanted to. And it all started from that class. What was your first band? Was that it? away from your school band? Uh, it wasn't my band, but we would go over to Ken Lance's before we were ever old enough to be in there. And we would play with bands. And because we sang three-part harmony, which was bloodline harmony, it was really good for our age especially. And, um, but my own band, oh, I guess the best of my first and it really wasn't my band. Ray Bingham from Tulsa, now lives at Claremore, put me in with the Country Cousins, which is later Stone Horse. And there were three sets of cousins, three families, and they're all kin folks to each other. And that was a really a lot of fun. And uh, but I don't I don't know, Cody. I can't remember my very first personal band. Have what a, a lot of, on that Ken Lance over there? There's a lot of people that aren't real familiar with the Ken Lance Arena or Ken Lance. Can you just can you fill in a little bit of that for everybody? I think it went on for 30 years, uh, and uh, Ruth, his wife, Ruthie, he called him. I uh, had a book called "Roping Roping My Dreams" or "Roping the Dreams," and she had a lot of history in there. What he would do is he'd have back then it was IRA Rodeo. He went PRCA some years. But he would have a rodeo, promote it all year long, and Ruth's daddy financed the whole thing. And they had a nice, real small arena with bleachers, nice bleachers, and he'd really hype it up. Big deal in Ada. See, the Ada rodeo prior to this was the biggest rodeo in Oklahoma at one time. But then when it shut down, then it went to the Ken Lance deal. Well, he would have entertainers come in and on a flatbed trailer, he pull it in there with a tractor and have him do a couple of songs for the crowd and say, okay, he's going to be at the dance. Y'all come to the dance. <laughs> well, at the rodeo, everybody go to the dance. I never will forget, we went over there one time to watch somebody. I was this Ray Price, Loretta or somebody. And Daddy was going, I, mean, I had friends with me. Alice had friends. Sreba had friends. And it was like nine of us daddy had to pay to get in. And it was Entourage. Five, it's five bucks a piece, Woo. 45 bucks. He <laughs> said, whoa, whoa, ain't doing this again. <laughs> 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 but yeah, it was a big deal in, in this part of the, the country back then. <laughs> I heard a good story about that place too, Jimbo. So I guess they used to wheel out this big wheelbarrow full of nickels during the rodeo and pick somebody to go get as many nickels as they can carry out of the arena. They can have them for free. They're yours. Well, they said, uh, <laughs> this is a family-friendly podcast, but I'm going to tell this anyway. So the the person they picked happened to be this old gal wearing a tube top came rolling out there to get as much nickels as she could possibly get 
on her body and carry out. Well, of course, the first thing she started doing is loading down her the front of her uh, tube top. And I guess when she stood up, the nickels just uh, brought the whole thing down, <laughs> outweighed it. The elastic wasn't hard, strong enough to hold up all those pounds of nickels in her tube top, and it, everything come flying out right there at the Ken Lance Arena. That's the one, one good story I heard about that place. Okay, when Reba, well, let me back up a little bit. Reba was going to the National Finals Rodeo just to watch it in Oklahoma City when it was at the fairgrounds. Daddy said, Reba, while you're up there, you're going to be up there anyway, why don't you ask Clem McSpadden if you can sing the National Anthem? We well, know why you're there. Okay. So she did, and he let her. Well, one night, Ken Lance knew about us singing at his place, and he knew Red Stegall from having Red booked into his place. He said, Red, I know there's three kids that really do sing good. I wish you'd listen to them. So by knowing Ken Lance and it all coming together, that's when Red heard Reba and took her to Nashville and got her started in the music business. Well, that's something else. Yeah. Thank all you, Ken Lance. Through, all through Ken Lance, yeah. Thank you, Ken Lance. You bet. That was a great story. Thank you. Thank you for that one. The Singing McIntyres. Was that you and... Reba and Susie. Okay. Yes. The teacher, Mr. Clark Ryan, from Wardville, the little town y'all just came through, you came right by his house. He was her teacher, and one Monday morning in band class, he comes in and he says, I wrote a song yesterday about your granddad, John. We sat down and listened to it and worked on it that hour at school. Went back to Chalky that night. He came over. We worked on it that night. The next night, we went to Oklahoma City and recorded this record that you saw on eBay or something. Clint McSpadden's Wall. Yeah, okay. Then we, we recorded that in November the 19th or 20th in 1970. Well, we there was about 320-some copies of it. And we took that thing home, Jimbo, and let me tell you, it sold 17 copies just like that. <laughs> <laughs> but then it tapered off. Right, yeah. yeah. But it was a big living room hit for us. And, of course, we loved it because his grandpap is about him, you know. And on the back side of it, we had an interview with him of me and Reba and Susie interviewing him. And uh, told some good stories about Burwell, Nebraska, and the pranks the Cowboys used to play on him and stuff like that. It's just random stories, just like we're doing an interview right, right now. Right. But it was a big deal. That was a us. good song. I enjoyed yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, and and a lot of people um, enjoyed it, and we get a lot of requests for it when we do shows and things, mm -hmm. even still. Hmm. Cowboy pranks. Let's get off the music for just a second. Okay. <clears throat> you've had to see you've had to be a part of you I would have to assume oh yeah and what's the best one that you can tell here well the one I can think of um, right off the top of my head me and J. Paul Williams and Rod Hartness were going to the northwest and we were making Union and Prineville do you remember that yeah. run and we was coming out of Prineville and I was in the back seat and uh, Rod said hey Pate didn't you have that song called The Rodeo Man I said well, yeah he said Sing a little bit of that for me. I said, well, I'm a rodeo rider. He said, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, Rod laughs at that a lot. Of course, you know, we, yeah, everybody pulls pranks on each other, you know. And, and, uh, but, we, yeah, we've, it's, that's part of rodeo and us having fun, you know, and with each other. And just like one time me and my second wife, we were at Pendleton, and, um, you know, there, after the slack, all day of slack, you know, people would tie their horses around to the fence and just go to the letter buck room. Well, I said, hey, you want to have some fun? She said, well, we're up here to have fun, ain't we? I said, yeah, here's what we're going to do. We're going to unsaddle all these horses. It must have been 15 of them lined up down through there. We're going to put their saddles on backwards. <laughs> so we did. Well, we got to one brown, and I said, whoa, you better leave this one alone. I said, why? I said, that's Cody Lee's horse. He rides Bronx. This horse going to tear something up. Yeah, I and remember I, that horse. Yeah. and I It was a dangerous horse. Yeah, I don't want to have to fix something. 
So we put them on backwards and everything, and and here come we got up in the stands and watching everybody come out of the letter buck room, <laughs> feeling no pain, to say yeah. the least. Yeah. Here comes J.P. Wicket from Salisaw, our fearless <laughs> director leader now. <nowadays. laughs> he he comes around the corner. He said. I, I, I look what they did to CA's horse. And he looked around and he said, Oh no, they got mine too. <laughs> now, that's a nice version. Right. <laughs> and then there's a time Ricky Canton and Ike Good got on Buster Records' horse and somebody else's horse after coming out of the letter buck room and was going to ride the horses downtown. And they didn't even know their horses were gone. And so they stopped and decided they needed some more refreshments, so they bought them a six-pack of beer. And this town cop stops them, and he said, Boys, I can't keep you from riding your horses downtown, but you can't drink and drive. <laughs> so he said, That guy put our beer in his trunk, and I know he went home and drank every bit of it. <laughs> so then they ride the horses down to that old Krabby's bar down, and, and it goes... You've been there. Uh, I can either confirm or deny that. <laughs> Rather deny it. you got to go down steps, you know, to get out in it. Yeah, I heard it's underground, underneath a, yeah, uh, another deal that. on the you bottom part. That. Yeah. That's what I heard, yeah, Jimbo. Yeah, I heard that, too. So, anyway, they tried to ride their, these two horses down these concrete steps, but the horses had more sense than they did, and they refused to go. So they tied them up to these highline poles outside. Ricky Canton and Ike Good did that. And so, but I don't, I think Buster was pretty good sports about it. He didn't get mad. I don't know. Buster's a pretty good yeah, sport Buster's about most things. Guy. Yeah. Heck of a roper, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, world yeah. champion. That's right. That's right. That town's got a lot of world champions lived in it. Oh, you bet. You bet. Seemed like there was a guy. I used to like the sign when I we'd pass through Buffalo there. There was a world champion, I think his name was Red Booger. And I just couldn't believe that uh someone's name was actually Red Booger. So Well I grew with some Buffalo at one time. Yeah, he lived there. He lived in Pahuska. Yeah. Before. He lived yeah. in Pahuska. He, he lived a lot. Of I think his kids were born in Pahuska. A good one was, of them. I think the boy was. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> George Carter told me one time that that I went home with I said, was Barton Carter his uncle? Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was Barton. George's uncle. Yeah, George's uncle. He said, come home with uh, Barton, going to stay all night, and he stayed six months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, Barton and Ike, they didn't invent that first horse trailer that Everett Bowman did, but they invented the first modern horse trailer that I guess they took the hell horse trailer pattern off of they took it back east to the madison square garden the first the first you know highway worthy horse trailer the first one just made it to pershing what i always heard pershing oklahoma did they, they made yeah 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 uh his daughter was telling me about something like that but george went on to tell me about the the other horse trailer they made okay. i guess okay. it was quite the horse trailer yeah i got a picture of it there in the museum but what'd you hear about the one in Pershing? Well, that's as far as it, they made it. They left the Husker going somewhere and they made it to Pershing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's probably what, five or six miles. Yeah. <laughs> Daddy, Daddy went to Pendleton 20 straight years. Back, you know, before air conditioners and four-lane highways and stuff. <clears throat> and, and, oh, pulled on them trailers by car. Yep. And he said one time he was, oh, he said, right in the middle of the day, I was just so tired. I had to keep going. And I saw this hitchhiker. So I stopped and picked him up. And I said, uh, Fuller, can you drive? He said, not very good. He said, well, just keep it on 40. So he said, if, he said, if I could ever lay down in the back and not watch, I'd be all right. <laughs> so I laid down and went to sleep, and I woke up, and I looked up, and that guy was leaning over that steering wheel, and he had a death grip on it. <laughs> <laughs> but but it was long enough to give him a nap, you know, and he got back to driving then. <laughs> Most rodeo cowboys will let anybody drive just so they can take a nap. It's the dangest thing yeah. I've ever seen. Oh, yeah. I was like 14 years old. My dad got in the back of the camper during the snowstorm. We didn't even have a boot from the camper to the front of the truck. Made me drive on to Odessa one time. <laughs> I didn't have a driver's license or nothing. <clears throat> 
but he needed him a good, a good nap, so. That's it. Just stretch out back there and take a good nap. So you were telling us about when Reba sang the national anthem, Ken Lance talked to Red to give y'all a listen. Right. What was that time like in your family right when she got scooped up and went to Nashville? Well, was it, it an exciting time it, for everybody? It was very exciting for everybody involved, but it wasn't wasn't an instant success. Oh, it wasn't an, it no. wasn't lightning in a bottle. No, no, that was 1976 and you'll hear people comment to me say, "Oh man, I remember when Reba first got started in 1987." <laughs> I said, "No, honey. It was way before that." And see her first uh, single, I Don't Want to Be a One Night Stand, only made it to 89 out of the top 100. It goes up in the bottom. Now, think about it. If when I got there, if you, didn't, if you didn't get in the top 20 on your first one, they didn't release a second one. But back then, they gave you time. And good thing because there wouldn't have been no Reba McIntyre. She'd been a school teacher. <laughs> well, she's not. <clears throat> yeah. She's not now. She is a But it took it took a while. Special lady. And see, if she was eight years with Mercury Records and still owed them hundred and sixty thousand dollars, they haven't they hadn't got in the black yet in the first eight years. Wow. Yeah. See, then she went to MCA, then Mercury went to sell and old cuts off of her and recoup their money back and see the way those contracts were is they put up all the money and you don't get a royalty check until you they get in the black all you get is your personal appearances and stuff what about when you got signed Pake? my first record went to 20 but my problem was the albums wouldn't sell in anything my first album only sold 50,000 records and see, that's why they let me go. I was having great radio success. My first record went to 20. My second one went to three. Number three on the Number charts. Number three, yeah. And Reba had a song on there in the top 100, top 20, I think it was. We've got the album in there. But anyway. Uh, well, that was something else. You to be number three and your sister being in the top 20. Yeah, it was. And you know, it all comes up slow. But the, the thing that was so special about Oklahomans was when Garth come along. His albums would debut at one. Now that is totally unheard of. That's as unheard of as Willie Nelson Stardust staying on the, the top 100 charts for 360 some weeks. Wow. Well, that Garth, he went to number one on the pop charts, too. I oh, mean, yeah. everywhere. That guy but, went everywhere, number but, one. But see, there's been a lot of people cross over. Johnny Cash crossed crossed over to the to the rock and roll and pop charts. A lot of people did, but no one has outsold Garth. And he's done so many remarkable things. Like, who would have thought he could take a rhythm guitar and sell out Las Vegas? Right. That's unheard of. He does so many things. And asked Reba, I said, Reba, how on earth is he still winning Entertainer of the Year after all these years? He says, he's selling out stadiums still. Yeah, how is he yeah. not winning Entertainer of the he Year after all these years? He went to Times Square that time. You, you remember when he went back Central to New York? Park. Over a million yeah, people. Yeah, Central Park. Central Park, 980,000 people. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I Googled it the other day, 980. Yeah. Yeah. And he, I heard an interview of him. He was telling, what was his wife's name, his first wife? Uh, Sandy. Sandy. Sandy, yeah said, what if nobody shows up? Can you imagine an old kid from Oklahoma could sell out or have that many people at, at Central Park in New I, York? I mentioned Ray Bingham, the, the booking agent from uh, Claremore in Tulsa. He said, that was the most surprise of my whole music career was Garth. He said, he used to show up when I would have people like Mo Bandy and people like Red and John Anderson at shows and he'd want to sit in with them. He come and asked me, because I was a promoter. He said, one time, I had a show with Red, and here come Garth. And he said, said ask him if I can sing a song with their band. And so, we, okay. So Danny, Red's brother, Danny Stegall, he said, Danny, this boy wants to set in. I said, all right, yeah, oh, you bet. So when he, when he gets on stage, he said, Danny said, what do you want to do? He said, Lone Star Beer and Bob Will's music. 
Well, that was Red's signature song, his ending song of during his show. So Danny says, okay. <laughs> so they fired away <laughs> on it. And Red, Ray said, looked over at Red, and Red looks up, turns around, and looks up at the band and said, He's doing my song. He's doing my song. <laughs> so when he got off stage, Red walked up to him and said, Boy, why did you sing my song like that? He said, Well, I knew the band knew it. <laughs> <clears throat> Who all did you get to open for? Anybody? Any big names or any big uh, events? Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, I opened for Alabama in Dothan, Alabama one night in oh, this wow. huge fancy tent in their heyday. See, we were on the same label together, RCA. And um, the biggest applause, see, the opening band is just it's just kind of racket or noise for everybody to wait on the, what they come there for. And I don't Alabama. You're in Alabama. People come see Alabama, not fake McIntyre. Right. And we know that. The thing you never do is go over. If you got 20 minutes, don't you play 21 minutes. They'll come tell you. Not the act, but the people involved. And so you always want to be under. We learned that. But, oh, yeah, the biggest applause we got that night was, you folks ready for Alabama? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, people like Eddie Raven. Um, um, oh, shoot, Reba, George. Uh, Garth actually opened for us one time. Get this. Yeah, I want to hear it. We were at playing me and Billy Parker of KVOO Radio in Tulsa. Garth was going to go on first and did. Billy come on, and then we came on and closed the show. And every time I talked to Billy, which was just a couple of days ago, I was talking about Mama's memorial service. He said, you remember the time that Garth opened for us? I said, oh, yeah, Binkies in Stillwater. Uh, oh, shoot, there was just Bellamy Brothers three or four times, Eddie Raven, um... Oh, gosh, there's been a whole slew of them. I, there's people I didn't open for, and that was uh, Dolly, Kenny Rogers. Uh, didn't ever did open for Merle, but open for Randy Travis, open for Keith Whitley. We did a show in Austin together. We want to own uh, Nashville now together. He asked me to come home with him two or three times, and I wished I had him. I just didn't. I don't know. I just didn't. He was one of the best of all time. Oh, yeah. He was a great guy. We was down to Austin one time, <laughs> and this promoter wanted Keith to open for me. And Keith's promoter said, no, that's insulting. We've been around longer than he has. And said, he's supposed to open for us. So they come to me and said, they want you to open. I said, I don't care. I'll open for Keith Whitley. Hell yeah. And be glad to. And then his promoter, no, we want him to open for you. I said, look, y'all work it out. I don't care. So what they did was... One of us opened for the first show, and the other one opened for the second show. Oh, yeah. I did. I was working with, with Sleep at the Wheel one time, and we were, uh, you all know, we were doing anywhere from 15 to 18 shows a month, one-nighters. If it was between, but if it was around 500 to 900 miles between shows, it, it didn't hurt. Over 1,000 miles, we could feel it in a pickup and camper pulling a 5 by 14 foot trailer we felt it we were doing this show somewhere back east I don't remember where with Sleep at the Wheel and so they was all out back looking at their bus and it had grass all under the front of it and dirt I said what in the hell happened is there a bus driver went to sleep Ooh. at the steering wheel. I said, y'all going to have to rename your band. <laughs> yeah, sleep yeah. at the wheel. Sleep at the wheel. And That's this right. little old Mexican was sitting over there nodding out. He still, I said, why ain't he in the bunk? I, said, I don't know. We can't get him to go lay down. He's been a good driver. Well, anyway, we opened for them. And so they come up afterwards and said, hey, they're wanting to get out of here. They got barely going to make it to the next gig said do y'all mind letting us open for you I said no any, we, we all get paid the same it doesn't matter to me so yeah and they never forgot that every time we would open, we'd play with them. hey you remember the time you let us open for you so we get out of there yeah you just do that 
and uh, was at a county fair one time and saw this goat that would blow up balloons. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. They, I'd like, I'd like to have me one of those. Yeah, I said, how, how long will he do that? It's as long as you put them in his mouth and hold them, he'll blow them up. Wow. Yeah. You see all stuff, all kind of yeah. things like that. If you see another one of them, try to buy them off yeah, of them for oh, me. Yeah, absolutely. I could really use kids a, would, kids one of those. Kids would love that. Take, uh, you mentioned Keith Whitley is really a nice guy. Who else, I don't want you to badmouth anybody, but who were some of the good guys that you came across in that business that we'd know? The business is is so um, different than, it's different on the inside than it looks on the outside. You know, when we're sitting in our recliner with some iced tea or a cold beer watching the award show or whatever, you think, man, they got it easy. You know, well, it looks easier f from our chair, but they've gone through a lot to get there. And they had to work hard to do it. They tell me, you hear all these rumors when you get into Nashville. Like, everybody in town turned Garth and Randy Travis down at least twice. All the record labels. They just slammed every door in their face. They just kept on being persistent with it. You hear all kind of, this road man, the booking agent named Bob Yance worked for Bobby Roberts Talent that did, did the booking for us. And Bob Yance was a drummer for Mel Tillis for eight years out on the road. He said the year that that Mel won Entertainer of the Year in 70-ish, 72 or something back there, he said, he told all of his, his managers and booking agents, he said, now this ain't gonna last long, and I know it. He said, I'm a songwriter. But book me anywhere you can book me, and I'll take it. They played 109 straight days. There was 17 on the bus with 12 bunks. One bus. Sounds yeah. a little bit like rodeoing. It's harder than any rodeo I ever did. Yeah, way harder. You, you get fatigued out, your voice gets tired, and uh, you get, uh, you have mu musicians that can't take it, and uh, they, had a really nice kid from Stonewall just begged me for a job. I said, Randy, you won't like it? You won't like it? No, it's Marty, I'm sorry. He said, oh yeah, I will. Oh, it's been my dream to get on the road. He came to me after about, <clears throat> oh, probably four or five weeks, and he said, hey, I ain't slept a wink since we've been on this deal. He said, I gotta go home. I said, I knew it, Marty. It's okay, go home. And you, your throat gets tired, your voice gets tired, but you got to put on a smile whether you feel like it or not. And all to answer your question, Jimbo, all of these guys and gals have worked hard to get there. So they're just old country people. Are they? That's yeah. what I was wondering. Yeah. I, Dwight Yoakam was strange <laughs> and we opened for him, but he had bashful more than anything. Mm -hmm. But once you got to talking to him, he's really a nice guy. Yeah. But uh, um, Gail Davies from Broken Bow was a little uh, put out with the whole industry because she was going out as I was coming in. And she had seen a lot, and she was tired of it, and she was ready to get the hell out of Dodge. And you can tell. It's like these hired hands around here. You can tell when they're getting ready to quit. Mm hmm you know, but, but yeah, we had a open for the Bellamy Brothers at the Ponkin Theater at Ponca City one night. And uh, that was when I was doing soundtracks. And we had this skit lined up. Uh, I was gonna talk about the country music band class and talk about uh, Roger and playing with, with uh, Alan. And I was gonna and there was a little girl in the class and she went on to make her way into gospel music. Are there any Susie McIntyre fans with us tonight? Oh, yeah, 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 some. And there was another girl, freckle-faced, red-headed, and she was anything but shy. Went on to become a superstar. And friends, have I got a treat for you tonight. Said, recently we have had a family reunion and they all came home. Make welcome, if you will, my two sisters, Reba and Susie McIntyre. 
Well, the crowd just goes crazy. Well, had it rigged up that my manager was supposed to tell these sound guys to just punch play on this deal. And it was a big drum roll. Do 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 all this that. Well, we told these guys that it was a hoax, it was a prank, that they're not really here. But they fell for it. <laughs> anyway, so when I did that, they just gawking and looking for Reeve and Susie. And with us telling them. And so my manager said, punch play, punch play. And there I am standing there, dead silent, <laughs> and all the crowd. And she had to literally climb over these guys to hit that play button to get this drum thing going. <clears throat> But stuff like that. And I, I, we've had girls go to screaming, go to pulling their hair over this skit, the stupid skit. Mm -hmm. And Daddy said, you know, you, you shouldn't do people that way. <laughs> I said, well, what do you mean? He said, lie to them like that. I said, Daddy, it's just an act. It's show business. He said, I don't care. That's lying to them. You shouldn't do that. <laughs> all, right, all I think about is being a... if. It, country music stars you know you got a line of girls waiting on you and you know you got the best of everything you don't think about all the work that they oh, no, that they no. uh had to do to get there at first i tell you one time me and reben susie was was gonna go play the kvoo picnic one morning and i woke up sick oh man i was sick if i wasn't throwing up i was on the pot both and we got in the car and headed up that way, pull over, pull over, and just all the way up through there. Finally got to Tulsa and I said, guys, something's wrong with me bad. Take me to the hospital. So they took me to St. John's. And they went and played the deal by themselves. And that evening they took my appendix out. So the next morning uh, the doctor come in there and I said, hey, was that really what's the matter with me, my appendix? He said, uh, well, you ain't sick, are you? I said, no. He said, that must have been it. <laughs> so, and we've known Guy Allen, a lot of people that they just let their appendix rupture, you know, nearly killed them, you know. But anyway, I was recovering from this and kind of give you a little bit of the earlier tough days at first. And Reba had just enough success to just put a band together. And Narvel and Preacher Williams and another player was staying at the Weenin Shack in Chalky. And they was making about fifty or seventy-five dollars a month. It was that bad. And when and Johnny Cash, I heard him talk about this, where everybody goes through it. The routing is awful when you're at an early stage. Because you'll take anything. Right. Well, Reba tells me, she says, and I've been playing bass over at Sulphur for a year and a half and singing 30 songs in a weekend, a night, and said, she said, I need a bass player. I said, okay. We left home in a van in this five by 14 foot trailer, and we went to Pagosa Springs, Colorado, played one night. Went to Pendleton and played four nights in that Dance Neal Armory building come back to Sedan, Kansas, played a show there. Went to Henrietta, Texas and played a show there. From there we went to Hemingway, South Carolina in a van and a trailer. And me still sore from this emergency appendectomy. Dang. Yeah. Well. I mean, it's a long ways from Hemingway, South Carolina to Pendleton, Oregon. Well, dang right it is. A long ways. How far is that? 40 hours? Oh, I don't know, but it was it was tough. And never will forget the night, but we had an eleven o'clock show at Hemingway that next morning, and I drove till two o'clock in the morning. I said I can't go any farther, so I pulled over, and these two boys, uh, guitar player and keyboard player, maybe I don't know what. So Reba told them to just go in, and I was at this truck stop. Go in and get you something to drink, coffee, whatever, and bring it right back. Well, I went back there and laid down. There had this this divan that laid down flat, and I laid down beside her, and man, I was just about to pass out. And boy, she got madder than a jap. I said, what's the matter? She said, they're in there sitting on the stools drinking coffee, and we're barely going to make this show. I'm going to fire them just as soon as they come out of there. I said, no, 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 do it after the show. <laughs> Don't do it now. So... Oh, she was fuming. 
We barely made it, man. Just as soon as that thing was over, you boys come here, and she let them go. And then she caught a plane black up back home, and I had to ride back home with them. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when I hired Roger Wills, the guy that now works for Alan Jackson. You see, she worked for Eva for eight years. And, she, and her Narvel was always bad about firing musicians and letting them go. We're looking for better ones instead of keeping what you got. So I'd see Roger, and I'd say, Roger, you still hanging in there? He said, yeah, they can't fire me. I said, why is that? I said, because they didn't hire me, you did. I said, yeah, but I don't write your checks. <laughs> so, but anyway, he, uh, they fired him, and, and he missed that bad accident in the airplane. Yeah. Well, that's that was a horrible accident. Yeah, too. that's the only good thing you can say about it. And and uh, uh, his wife, too. Uh, I'll think of her name here in a minute. She he they fired her before that deal too. But you know, fate. That's just the way life turns out. Yeah. I imagine there's a lot of good times on the road too. Oh yeah, oh yeah. See, uh, the boy that was from Ada named. Um, Dave Gant, keyboard player and fiddle player. He's been with Garth for like 20, 30 years. And he was with me prior to that. And uh, he's a great, great talent. And, uh, but yeah, a lot of fun, fun deals. Uh, you know, you go to through Yosemite Park and, and uh, it's, oh, I just, I could just, Go. I could write a full book on on my two years on the road with RCA Records. You already got one book. Yeah, I do. But it's it's a it's a. You should write another one. Well, we're trying to redo this one and and sell it worldwide. Okay. Yeah, Janie Carter's helping me with it. She's Tom Carter's wife who helped Reba with her first book, and we're trying to see. My first manuscript was one hundred and sixty nine thousand words really and I showed this manuscript to mama and Jimbo I said I said mama is there if I got any stories mixed up or wrong she said no no your stories are good but you got to take them cuss words out of there <laughs> I said mama it ruins the story he said I don't care you get them out of there I said well mama you cuss she said yeah but you never saw me put it in print <laughs> 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 so I left them in there and I, and the disclaimer up front, I tell people don't leave this book in church and don't show it to your kids and all that. But I'm a cowboy, and that's the way I talk. And so if you don't like the way I talk, don't read it. It's that simple. Well, Tom, her husband, who helped Reba write her first book, liked the stories, and he liked everything about it. And so, but he said it's too long. Well, create space. First cut it down from 169,000 to 82,000 words. And then they said it's too long. So we got it down to about 62,000 right now. And we're in the process of putting the pictures to it and trying to make it. And I don't know if people read books anymore, Jimbo, or not, but they're, they're pretty excited about it. Yeah, the books are making a big comeback, Pete. Are they? I think so. Oh. There you go. And if you well, put enough pictures in it, I'm going to read it, too. Okay. Yeah, there we had 200 <laughs> pictures in that first one and um, and 82,000 words, 70-some chapters. And um, i got to tell you about James Maxwell. Well, right, up, right up here at Kiowa. A super guy, family-owned APCO gas station. As honest as it was anybody, Jim. And so... He'd been in the gas station business a long time. Yeah, I can tell this. Okay. And so I said, James, what's the funniest thing that ever happened to you in your service <laughs> station days? He said, well, well, Pakey he talked real slow like that. He said, when I worked for Mr. Heath down on the south end of town, he said, no, he called me Pate. He said, Pate, you know how you take that plug out of the rear end of a vehicle and you stick your finger in that hole there 
and then if you get some of that oil on your finger, you're okay. But if it's don't, you add some. Yeah, I know, I know that, James. He said, well, there was a lady walked in one morning, pulled her pickup right in front of the door and walked up to Mr. Heath and said, Mr. Heath, would you check the grease in my rear end? Last night, my husband stuck his finger in it and said it was bone dry. <laughs> so I said, well, what did Mr. Heath do? He said, mm. he just looked at her. <laughs> that all we fired? <laughs> no. Heck no, it's hard to get fired from this deal, Pete. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> About like shoot help. <laughs> Impossible to get fired from this deal. That's right, that's right. We noticed earlier today that your name, God-given name, wasn't Pake. Right. P-A-K-E. Right. So how'd that come about? How the heck did that come about? Good question. And this is in the book. Whenever Mom and Daddy were expecting Alice... Then instead of calling the expectant baby it or junior or the baby, they made up Mexican names. Hers was Pedro Joe. All right. When she was born, they named her after daddy's mama, my grandmother, Alice Hayhurst, Alice Kate Hayhurst McIntyre. Well, when they were expecting me, my Mexican name was Pecos Pete. Well, so then when I was born, they named me after a steer roper by the name of Dale Haverty, Dale, and a bull rider, Stanley Gomez, so they named me Dale Stanley. But the Pecos Pete thing stuck, and short for Pecos is Peck. That's where Peck come across. Well, confusing all my life. All my friends call me Peck. Uh, my birth certificate said Dale Stanley, my driver's license uh, Pake, uh, my checking accounts, Dale Stanley's, all back and forth. So after all this confusion, I want to go down to the courthouse down there in the token. And I said, Judge, I want to change my name. He said, what to? I said, Pake. He said, thought it is Pake. I said, that's the confusion. My name is really Dale Stanley McIntyre. He said, really? I said, yeah. He said, I've known you all your life. And then I said, oh, yeah, we got to clear this up. And I told him the confusion. From now on, it's Pake. What what you want for a middle name? No middle name. Pake McIntyre is my real legal name. Perfect. We got to put that on Wikipedia now. On Pake's Wikipedia. Right. It is now officially Pake. Formerly yep. Stanley. And that is worth just what it costs you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Pake's a pretty frugal guy, Jimbo. Pretty frugal. When it came to rodeoing, for sure. I, uh, well, actually, one time he let me jump in with him, and, and um, he didn't hit me up for any gas money or anything, because I think I was way broker than him at the time. He let me and my son ride with him to uh, Cheyenne one time from... Hardin. Hardin, Kansas. Hardin, Kansas. Yes, yeah. sir. I think so. Yes, sir, but yeah. I did remember one, <laughs> one kind of funny story from when I was a kid. I don't know. I was maybe 12, around 12 years old. We were at Cheyenne. And somehow I got in the pickup with Pake to go eat lunch at the uh, a buffet restaurant at the mall there. Yeah. Country Buffet. Yeah, good one. And I was just with him and a, a couple other guys, 12 years old. My dad wasn't there. I don't know how I ended up with y'all. I think maybe with through the Kylers or something. I'm not sure. Probably. When we, when we sat down after we all ordered, Pake went ahead and paid for mine, but he went and added it up. And told me what I owed him at the end of it. Twelve dollars forty-seven cents plus my drink. <laughs> and I think you told me, well, I'd rather owe you forever than beat you out of it. Yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! See, I grew up with with kids like that, and rope with their daddies, and rope with James Allen, and. And me and James and Reba were out on the road before Guy and Gip ever started. And I remember we were at that old fort there uh, south of Laramie, and James called home, and he said, Oh, Gip got hurt. Oh, what, what happened? We had his legs on the end of a tailgate, and they backed into a haystack, and he hurt his legs. And, you know, things like that. And, uh, man, and we, we left. We roped at Greeley one night. We were roping steers, calf roping, and team roping with each other. 
and we roped at Greeley one night, and him and Reba was going to drive to Lander that night. Remember Lander? Mm-hmm. And so we had slack the next morning. Well, I said, okay, y'all wake me up. In an open air, back end of a pickup with saddles, suitcases, a guitar, blankets, all that stuff around me. I got a, I get a sleeping bag, and I woke up, and we were pulling into Lander, and the sun was coming up. That's the best night's sleep I'd ever had. James said he got tired and uh, said, man, he felt the truck just shaking like that. And he looked up, and Reba was driving, was going down one of them big old mountainous hills going 80 <laughs> miles an hour pulling four horses. said, and James was not like Daddy. Daddy was saying, slow this thing down. You know, what are you, crazy or something? James said, hey, Reeb, you think you might be going just a little fast? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, yeah, I guess so. And we was going along there. He had no air conditioning in this pickup. Up there around Slap Out. You know where Slap Out is. Up there by uh, this side of Buffalo. And uh, by Hardest, Hardest D up there, little old town. Yes, sir. I and know was going down one of these big old hills. Here come this gust of wind through the cabin, just blew my hat right off my head, right out the window. We got down to the very bottom, and James had an old sorrel horse you couldn't hold with both hands with bits, and no mouth on him at all. His hair, old Snip was on the back end. His hair, get on old Snip with a holler and lope up there and get your hat. Well, I got off and got my hat. I got back on him, was trotting him back to, down there to the pickup. And he got to loping, and pretty soon he got to run, and he ran away with me with his hauler, and he just passed the pickup. <laughs> and James was just nearly falling down laughing when we passed him. But we had so much fun. And, uh, but anyway, Reba she didn't have nothing to do. That was in 74, about two hours, two Two years before she got her contract, and she just wanted to go, and uh, that was very memorable. A lot of fun. Was she doing any entering right then, or was she just no, no, she just going swamp on. driving? And we've got a picture with me when in Ogallala with that suitcase standing there beside Margaret Deacon, and I asked her that Reba's got like twenty-seven thousand pictures in a computer and on zip drives. She loved, you can't be around her five minutes to, let's take a picture, let's take a picture. And uh, besides, we got to do that before before y'all leave. And I asked her the other day, you still got that? Well, let me look. Well, she hadn't got back with me about it. We got other business to do and stuff. And we're trying to swap out some land that we joined. Some of her land's inside my place. Some of my land's inside her. We're trying to swap it out and stuff. And, and people are always calling, wanting to sell some land inside of it that's been in there and their family for years, a 20 acres, for example. And and they call me because I've been working on it for 20 some years and it's inside of hers now and, you know, stuff like that. But so I forget to find out if she got that picture, but I'd like to have that picture. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have to find out. Uh, ask her if she has any uh, Ben Johnson pictures while you're talking to her for us. I sure will. Yeah. Because, you know, they put on that celebrity yeah. team roping up there they did. for years. I bet she does. I liked uh, any copies of the old programs or any old pictures she might remind, have. Remind me to do that. I got to tell you a story about that celebrity roping up there. I want to hear it. I was going to ask you about it. They they invited me to come up there. And so, anyway, who brought my fiddle in? We did. Oh, okay. Anyway, anyway, uh, they want to have us a practice deal before that night to run these steers through. And so... Uh, here come these guys walking up with these nylon ropes. And I said, I jumped up. Hi, boys. How y'all doing? I'm Pate McIntyre. They introduced themselves. And I said, what do y'all what do y'all do for a living? I said, well, we're in the movie business. Really? Man, I'm a movie buff. I've seen a lot of movies. What movies have y'all been in? Well, we was in such and such. I said, no, I hadn't seen that one. <laughs> and their faces dropped a little bit. Well, what about so-and-so? Oh, no, I hadn't seen that one either. And their face dropped a little bit. Pretty soon, they ain't smiling anymore. And I'm serious. I had not seen a movie these people had been in. <laughs> and come to find out, it's Wilford Brimley. And, uh, and uh, oh, I can't think of his name right now. 
And next time I saw Wilford, I said, Wilford, I apologize. I'm so sorry. But I I went and looked up all these movies like Cocoon and all those and said, you're great in those. <laughs> and he said, oh, don't think nothing about it. It ain't no big deal. And then he gave me a cassette of him singing. Yeah. He's quite the singer. Who was the best roper out of those pro, the celebrities that would come to the pro celebrity? Uh, none of them. None of them. <laughs> <laughs> they were good actors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So you you were probably the best pro celebrity roper out well, there. Well, no. Number three on the charts, national finalist. Well, it's pro and a celebrity. Here's a pro celebrity combination. Yeah. Uh, you should have been roping with yourself. Well, <laughs> no. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a has been that never was. <laughs> well, we sure think you're something, Pink. Well, thank you. Thank you. What are you up to nowadays? Well, I. For a hobby, I play fiddle, and I'm starting to sing again because I only have one vocal cord. Yes, sir. And when I got out of the, those strokes, I could just barely whisper like that, just barely talk. And it's coming back. I can sing a little bit, and uh, I feel like I've got a list of 30, three or four songs that I do, uh, just with a click track so I can work on it and start over. And... Uh, I don't have a lot of stamina with it, especially when I've been talking a lot, like I did this morning. But, um, and I'm still running Stalker Steer Yearlings. So this is my 54th year into this business. When I was 13 years old, a friend of mine gave me that brand up there, and he gave me three cows, three calves, and 11 heifers. And we didn't, we weren't in the cow business. So we run steers, so I sold them and bought steers back. Then, by the time I was got out of high school, I had a hundred calves saved up, paid for. And uh, so, that's part of my 54 years into this business. And now, we run uh, this, this summer we're gonna run 20, about 2,200 steers. And we run them on 7,000 acres of land uh, with about, oh, nearly 5,000 acres of it owned, the rest of it's rented. And uh, so, it's right now is the toughest probably because everything costs so damn much oh, yeah. and the packers are ma making most of the money and everybody else is pretty much starving your daughters they had a little bit of musical talent i i remember because y'all used to uh sing the national anthem in a lot of rodeos and and i even seen a picture back there right here well the singing yes, mcintyres the new singing mcintyres what about your your boys Okay. Your, young, your young boys, they got any of this musical talent that yes. your whole family seems to have? Yes, yes, but I want to tell you a story about Chisholm yes. and Cheyenne. Chisholm loved Alan Jackson. Well, Alan came to the night show one night. Well, I go ask Roger. Roger, you know, the bass player. Roger, you, you got to get me a ticket in, just two, if you can just get me in with Chisholm. She was real little. So, uh, let me see. So he goes and works on it. For it comes back about 30 minutes later, there ain't nothing. There ain't a backstage pass available. There's no way to get y'all through the gate. I said, oh, hey, man, he just apologized. That's okay. Don't worry about it. Well, the little Chisholm's face just dropped. Well, I waited till she, we come back to the camper. She said, we're not going to get to go. I said, just be patient. We, I'm not through figuring this deal out. So... I waited till that whole big 11,000 seat grandstand got full. And I said, come on. The rest of the other two girls had to stay in the camper and Katie. So we went around there and right to where they take the tickets that were up that big old long ramp that goes up there. Um, there was a concession table up there selling Allen t-shirts. And I said, uh, we don't have a ticket. But my little girl's a big Allen fan. Can we at least go up there and just buy a T-shirt for her? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. So we go up there. And I said, now, Chisholm, I had my back to those people down there. I said, uh, take your time here. So she did, and she bought her shirt, and I paid for it. I said, now, look around me and see if they're looking at us. <laughs> she said, yeah, they're looking right at us. So I said, well, keep, keep shopping, keep shopping. So pretty soon, uh, she did act like she was looking and pointing. I said, now look around me. She said, they got their backs turned. 
Boy, way we went. We went all the way up to the top, got on the back ledge and watched the whole show and they never came after us. <laughs> well, you gotta be creative. That's, That's right. probably from all them years of sneaking into rodeos yeah. when you were a kid. Yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of people think, oh, like Tommy I took up there this year, she wouldn't sit in a seat that wasn't assigned to us. I said, what difference does it make? She said, somebody's bought this seat and they're gonna come move us out. I said, all right, then we'll go sit in that one. Oh no, that would just embarrass me to no end. <laughs> well, you lose all that as a kid, as a rodeo kid. You don't, you don't get embarrassed, embarrassed over stuff like that. Oh no, well, yeah, well, a lot of times my uh, parents they didn't have enough <laughs> enough money to buy tickets for us to get in, and them pay their entry fees. It didn't seem like oh, you know, no. so we had to sneak in, yeah. whether it was in the trailer, in the camper, or they drop us off a little ways down the road, and you crawl over the fence and oh, yeah. go to the rodeo like that. And we used to, we used to look under the bleachers after the rodeo the next day for loose change. I was just down there eating dirt. <laughs> <laughs> did you know? Did you hear the story about Ike Rude logging his horse with the dead horse that they killed on the wild horse race? <laughs> no, sir. Yeah, he's drunk, of course. He's dragging this dead horse up and down the racetrack the next morning. Uh, they didn't take too kindly to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, stuff happens. You got to work your horse somewhere or another. Well, horse it wasn't hurting dead. that horse. He was already dead. He's already past hurting. But, no big problem with that. Uh, yeah. Today, but he got 10 years in the pen for that today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's called beating a dead horse. Yeah. <laughs> Against the law. Yeah. It's against the law nowadays. Yeah, yeah. It's against the law nowadays. All right, Jimbo, get in this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> <Too much. laughs> Jimbo calms everything down. <clears throat> He's got a good head on his shoulders. He does. Unlike me, I'm a just a, a moron sometimes over no, here, Jimbo. No, no. Nah, you're not bad. Well, your boys. Oh, Their yeah. musical talent. Yeah, yeah. Um, they've got that personality, especially Jackson. Pecos is really serious for a kid eight years old, but uh, Jackson will talk to anybody. And uh, their, you know, uh, their mother and I divorced, and so they don't live with me full time. But I had them on stage and doing things, and uh, and we'll talk to anybody. In fact, there's a. Mary's Barn over at South of Stonewall has a stage show. And I take them over there. And um, so we do a sound check. And um, and they're up around stage and everything. They're real comfortable with it. Well, we were, the show was getting ready to start. And I said, Pecos, where's Jackson? He said, he pointed toward the stage. I said, he's on stage? Yeah, and he was in, he was on stage before the show, sitting on a bar stool, talking to the crowd. Hmm. I thought that's kind of strange. A little kid doing that, mm -hmm. you know. And he was he's probably four. I know it. Yeah, it's over two years ago because they all shut down during the COVID thing. That's about two years ago. He's six now. He's four. So that, I thought that was pretty different. And you got to. You got to get past that. Just like right over here at Cairo, when we were kids, they used to have a coon hunter's ball. And my Uncle Peck, who owned 8,000 acres of this country, Grandpap's brother, and he had a, a niece that he offered to give $5 to just to get up and sing one song. And she wouldn't do it. And they come back telling that. And he said, man, we'd have sang all night for five bucks, but we didn't go over there, you know. It's just, we all, we're all born to do different things. And it's a good thing, like Mama, you say, it's a good thing everybody don't like the same Sal, I means Sally, girl, or there wouldn't be enough Sal's to go around. So we're all built different. And even though when we're kids, we think we're all like peas in a pod, but when we grow up, we're all different. There's Republicans, there's Democrats. There's some people like this, some people like that. Good thing we don't all like to rope steers. Singing or roping steers if you had a choice? If you had to choose. Uh, roping steers. 
I have dreams about roping steers. Do you? Sometimes, especially around this time of year when Cheyenne just got over and Pendleton's coming yeah, up and yeah. things like that. My, mine is, is I'm roping this, I'm running this hard running steer. And I run up there and rope him. He's trying to get away. And just when I rope him and get him a trip, I start out of there and then wake up. Mm. <laughs> that ain't no funner. No, than... miss the rest of it. Well, that's a good time, though, right there. Oh, oh my gosh. Yeah, it's... I, I know there's no money. It'll. I tell these young boys, they said, guys, I know it'll beat your checkbook up. I know there's a lot of pressure. And just like I tell T, uh, Tim Prather and Bud Upton and all these guys that I've talked to, Walter Arnold, of course, but, uh, Alan, Alan Keller, talk to all these people. I say, you know, we didn't realize how much fun we were having at the time. We were too serious. And Tim says, yeah, but I was broke. I needed to win something to get to the next. And I said, oh, welcome to the party, pal. We were all like that. That's what's so fun about it. Just like Jim Davis showing up drunk, roping drunk all the time. We were up there at Cheyenne talking. He was sitting there talking. This kid was sitting and listening. And I said, remember how drunk you used to be? You'd be drunk by 10 o'clock and the roping didn't start till one. And you was soused. And this kid was saying, asking him, said, you mean you rope? drunk at a rope and he said well hell yeah I practiced that way <laughs> <laughs> you know he was really something else so <laughs> he would he'd take a case of beer to the roping pen early in the morning to drink on it all day I remember when he quit rope when he quit drinking he had already won the world a couple times and then he he got to drinking a little bit and roping yeah. and then when he quit drinking for a while and started roping again they called him the new Jim Davis and uh, he was really kicking everybody's butt there for a while yeah. Right after that. Jim, uh, Jim's a, uh, first time I ever saw Jim, he's about four years old. And he could really cuss. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, like a sailor. And I thought, boy, this boy here knows some words I ain't never heard before. That's at Osage County. We yeah. were cussers up here. But, you know, then I think it was, he might have been five because the next year he went to school and the next year he come to shine, he didn't cuss at all. <laughs> Going to school that first year got him out of cussing. It turned him up a little bit. Yeah. Well, I think there's something in the water up there because Jim was a cusser as a kid. And then I remember uh, Dee and Melanie Kyler, they always got a cuss when they oh, were yeah. kids. Oh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I always associated Osage County with people that cuss. That's the reason <laughs> I'm, that's one reason I moved up there because I, I like I love doing my college. fair share of cussing. Hey, we went through there the other day on the way to Cheyenne. Did you? Yeah, we did. When uh, Tommy wanted to go see the, you know, Pioneer mm -hmm. Woman deal and everything. Did you take her by the Buck and Flamingo? We oh, were on my. our way. We didn't get to, and she... Had to get to Cheyenne. Yeah, I had to get to Cheyenne, and we had two days to travel. We traveled Monday and Tuesday. And I said, we need to go by. Said, okay, we'll do it, we'll do it, we'll do it. Then we got you got to hanging around shopping. <laughs> and I found me a bench and somebody to talk to. So we left. And she was they're doing the movie right there on the street. Oh, yeah. Know? And she had to go down there and watch. Well, honey, they do. Uh, there's been millions of movies made, and it's all like this. You know, this movie up there is the largest budget movie in American history. They're filming right now in Pahuska. There's never really? been more money spent on a movie in American history than this one in Pahuska. They're not done yet, either. And they're still going. Why? Well, why does it cost so much? Why? Uh, they're, they, they went back. They're not doing any uh, CGI special effects or anything. They're actually building all the oh, sets and everything up there. It's really something else. They made all the dirt streets back dirt, redid all the... Uh-oh. Oh, my Lord. No, it's okay. It's okay. You can't hurt it. Well, we were going to see if you could get that baby out here and do one for us right at the very end. That is a 1910 German Saxon fiddle. Why is that worth about 100000 Oh, no, I doubt. It cost, uh, oh, it was given to me as a present in 2000 uh, from a good friend from Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And it was put together in Spokane, Washington by London violin maker. And it is uh, a right-handed fiddle completely dismantled. Every piece on it was laying out on a big table. And they put it back together as a left-handed 
fiddle. Sorry, we touched it, Pink. No, It'll never happen again. It. You can't hurt it. <laughs> you can't hurt it. Oh yeah, you can hurt it. You can bend it, break it in a thousand pieces, but no, you can't hurt it like that. Well, Jimbo, we've been sitting here talking for a while. You got anything for Pink? Oh, I don't know. Just thank him for inviting us down and uh, go over some of his his life story. And I was especially glad to get to talk about his grandpa. You know, because everybody remembers, still remembers Clark, but. John was back there far enough back that he's kind of lost in history maybe a little bit, and it was good to hear some of those stories. He was a great cowboy and, and really a, a pioneer, you know. They didn't have it as easy as these guys today. And can you imagine riding your horse to the 101 ranch to go to a rodeo? I mean, that's one that's pretty bad. Riding a train to New yeah, York City train, with you know. your horse. So so that, that was that's pretty neat. Spend 38 days out there not have any money, hoping you win something. Yeah, yeah. Don't trying, you know they were trying pretty hard? Trying to get you a job with a stock contractor. Yeah. Do anything. Yeah, pick up Bronx, yeah. whatever. Feed the horses, feed this. Yeah. Just just want to get away from Cole County. <laughs> yeah. What an amazing family, though, Pakes oh, oh, into. absolutely. One thing I forgot to tell you, when Shaw and, and Grandpap went to Pendleton the first year, about the rope thing. You know, that Cabbage Hill, you know, right now it winds to, to get away from the grade. Yeah. Well, back then it was straight up that hill. And they had, when they left, they had, they were hoping he wouldn't pull it. So they had to unload the horses and one ride and lead, lead a horse while the other one drove the rig up it to get back out of there. <laughs> We've had a few rigs. I thought we might have to do that too a couple times, but never had to. I, d I did it in a snowstorm one time in Flagstaff going to Phoenix to the rodeo. And they said, you took the high road? Man, you take the southern route. I said, I will, going back. <laughs> <laughs> well, it has a big old hill coming into Pendleton, though, still. Oh, yeah, Cabbage Hill. That's a great hill to come down. You know, That's a great fly, hill to come down. We fly anymore. We fly out of Love Field on, a sa on Sunday like morning, and we fly into Walla Walla get a rent a car we're into our house that we rent there in pendleton by eight or nine o'clock then the next week we fly out of walla walla like 5 30 a.m and i'm back here by that night by nine o'clock think how much fun you would have had on a good old-fashioned road trip pink yeah but i can't take that anymore <laughs> <laughs> i can't i can't take them miles like i used to you still got your old camper around here somewhere? No, no, no. <laughs> it's gone. But, uh, boy, uh, you know, we used those those campers. We left one time in a pickup and camper and seven of us in a in that rig. We left Orange, Texas by Beaumont at 4 o'clock in the morning on Sunday. And we were supposed to be in Chatham, New Brunswick the following Tuesday night for a show. Chatham, New Brunswick is 500 miles north of Bangor, Maine. Whoa. We were give out halfway there. We got to Bangor, Maine on a Monday. Well, let's see, Monday, Monday evening, just at dark, I think it was, just to go into this motel and clean up and just get right back on the road. And we told this guy that what we were doing, and he said, boys, you about got it whipped out. You only like 500 miles of two-lane highway. <laughs> <laughs> and that's some, uh, that's really something else up there. I've only been up in that. I used to work for a company out in that direction, Jimbo. And it is a lot. It's still just two-lane highway all the way up there. Wow. Then I got up there and got food poisoning. We played this first. This We had a lot of shows up there and all the way back down. But the deadheaded up there was the hard part. But we went out and eat, ate at this fish place, nice place. And I went in and took a shower before the show in this motel. Boy, it hit me. Only time I ever had food poisoning. And the place was packed. And uh, that fiddle felt like an anvil. And it's all I could do to stand up. And I finally had to set my fiddle down. And... I'd do three, three songs, and the toilet was upstairs. Ooh. Yeah. So I made three trips up there 
and finally the road manager come up and I was laying on this bed back up there and he said he called me Biggs he said Big you sick ain't you I said I don't care if this whole place burns down around me I can't go back <laughs> down there and I did nine songs all I could do and they docked me $1,300 in a packed house the hmm. band went ahead and played but I just couldn't finish it took me to the hospital and went to put IVs in me and had about two days I was better even though I did a show that next night, but I was way better. I could do it. But if, if you know, you had food poisoning. Oh yeah, I've had it probably fifteen times in my life. You've but had food poisoning fifteen times. Well, I've worked on the road a lot, Pake, and uh, you know, you're just playing Russian roulette when you're not cooking it yourself all day. Anytime you eat, you're just playing Russian roulette. I feel if you're not eating at your house. Well, that's true. Have you had food poisoning, Jimbo? Never had. Oh, it's sick. But it, a couple of the times I, w- I ate some... Listen, listen how stupid I am. I ordered some uh, clams in Phoenix, Arizona one time. <laughs> yeah. You get what you, you know, deserve what you get. I ordered a big old plate of clams in Phoenix, Arizona. And that might have been the sickest I had ever been that night. And the next day. It was, it was really, really, really bad. Bad old deal. And I took a bite of one. I was like, oh, well... Never really eaten too many clams. I wonder if that's what they're supposed to taste like. <laughs> a, I don't know. It was about $30, $40 worth of food, so I ate a big portion of it, even though I was pretty sure that ain't what it was supposed to taste like, but I wasn't so sure. Why would, you order, that, why would you order clams out in the desert? Well, I've been asking myself Your that microphone sink. for 20 years, Jimbo. Yep. For 20 years, Jimbo since I did it but yeah if you work on the road and you eat out every day all the time you're just playing Russian roulette anytime you eat I agree I got I got to I got one one quick yeah come on story you can keep telling any stories you want Everett Shaw told me one time he was traveling with uh, Bob Crosby and Bob was bad about ordering a raw steak sandwich just for the fun of it I figured he would be just to look at him I mean that's kind of yeah, what I expected yeah, to order just crazy would be stuff. a medium rare or rare and so he ordered it and and Shaw went back to the restroom back there in the kitchen and he heard this waitress turn in the order to this cook and this this cook said what you got out there damn dog <laughs> <laughs> wild horse <laughs> you know they say that I was reading a deal just the other day, they say that he used to cut his cinch strings in front of all the other uh, ropers just to mess with their head. Daddy yep. said back when they used to let everybody sit in the arena at Cheyenne, you know, all the contestants yeah. used to come in the arena. Like Pendleton is now still. Well, it used to be. They don't let him do that anymore. Oh, they don't? No. He would sit there on his horse. What's with the world his... coming to you? You can't sit out in the arena at Pendleton? Yeah, no, I'm not sorry. At Pendleton, no. And so. Now, in the slack you can, but not during the, during the purse. But anyway, he would sit there with his leg across the saddle horn and gird it up. And then, then while them bucking horses come wide, wheeling by, and he just like that and catch them just to, just to get jerked down in front of the crowd. <laughs> they say he was wild. Yeah, just, just for the fun of getting jerked down. He said his lifelong ambition was to get killed in front of the crowd. Oh, That's what Daddy said. He tried it a few times. Do you see those pictures of his horses when he was really giving them a bad go? No. That uh, some of those famous pictures of him. I mean, the, oh, you're getting jerked down. You mean? Yeah. I mean, yeah. There's only one foot of the horse on the ground, or none mm-hmm. on the ground. And he's the, sitting up there, holding rope like nothing. Is yeah, going he's on. he's just sitting there like he's yeah. <laughs> like he's sitting at the kitchen table. Right. He's had his right leg broke like five or six times from getting horses jerked down on him. Daddy said that he got in the car one time on a hot, hot day and he pulled his old boot off and said it stunk like a dead yearling. And he said, Daddy said he died a thousand deaths over that old broke leg. Yeah. And uh, he went to this, what is it, May, where's Mayo Clinic at? Up in Minnesota. Minnesota. Daddy said he went off up there and he was going to get it fixed. And uh, he, uh, he 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 wouldn't stay. He he paid this porter five bucks or this guy five bucks to get his clothes, and he went down there to pay his bill at the front desk. And uh, he said, uh, "I want to pay Bob Crosby's bill." He said, uh, 
He said, well, we don't have it added up. They're fixing to take his leg off upstairs. And so he left. Yep. He said, well, send it to Roswell, New Mexico. Now, that's Daddy's story. Right, right. I'd heard they were going to take it, wanted to take his leg off, and he treated it himself. And they sure looked bad. Yeah, it didn't look good, but at least that he had it. Is. That's the exact kind of bit that he would ride, too, right there. Yeah, kind of like this, only a lot like it. shank, and, and uh, but that's another story. <laughs> Bob yeah. Crosby. I like old Bob. I like reading about him. There's a lot of things. I like that Jeep he used to drive. That he got killed in. He said, Daddy told me that, that he took a horse up there of Fred Lowry's to Pendleton and said his knee, this horse's knee, was big as a basketball. And said Fred wouldn't ride him, and he'd come home, but it was Fred's horse. And Bob won the steer roping on him to Pendleton. That's something else. Yeah, and, and Fred wouldn't even ride him up there. He was a real cowboy. Pink. What? Before we get done with you, we did bring the fiddle up. And we were hoping if you would do uh, do one for us. What do you want to hear? I hate to put you on the spot. <laughs> well, well, we'd love to hear, obviously, the Ballad of John McIntyre. Uh, that's not really a fiddle tune. Well, let's hear your best fiddle tune then. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or whatever you want to do. Okay. Acapella, <laughs> fiddle, tell us a poem. You know, one morning, Pete called me up about 5 o'clock in the morning. My wife was real happy about it. <laughs> and uh, he told me a poem about a horse trade. 5 o'clock in the morning. He said he likes to call all his old cowboy friends <laughs> at 5 o'clock in the morning sometimes. I feel better that time of day. I get tired all about this time of day. But when I first wake up, that's when I go practice. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, that was uh that was a lot of grand entries right there growing up. Oh it was. It was. Well, Pake, thank you for talking to us today and we, we sure appreciate it. I enjoyed it, boys, and I appreciate y'all coming down. Yes, sir. We're just trying to help keep the Western Way of Life alive and well and uh, not let everybody forget about all these great, great legendary guys. Yeah, because there's a lot of people that don't know who Olin Young was or Tuffy Thompson. Daddy used to come back in the late 60s. Who won that steer roping? Tuffy Thompson. Well, I never met Tuffy Thompson. The next week, who won this one? Tuffy Thompson. Who won this one? Tuffy Thompson. Yep. He was good. Great steer roper. Great guy. Yep. Do you ever know his brother, Bobby? Yes. Yep. 
Yes. I pulled over on the side of the road out there in West Texas one time, and I was in that camper, and somebody knocked on my back of my camper door, and it's Bobby. And who'd he work with? Was it four sixes? Or? I think four sixes or triangles one. I'm not yeah. sure of which, Jim. But anyway, he wanted me to come and go home with him and sleep in a real bed. I said, Bobby, I can't. I, I haven't got time, but I sure would like to someday. But I never did. Yeah. Great guy. Yep. One time I did a show at, at Tulia when we was on the road doing all those shows there at that Switzer County Fair Barn. And uh, after it was over, Tuffy was there, of course, and he had had a nip, maybe. And he's, well, I went over there and sat down by him, and them guys began to sacking all that stuff up. Man, he had to pack it in that 5 by 14 foot trailer just perfect, or you couldn't get the door shut. It was that tight. And he said, what are you doing sitting here? I said, talking with you. He said, you get your butt up, and you get over there and help them boys load that equipment. I said, Tuffy. It's their job to do that. I don't do that. They do that. No, I don't I don't care. You get up and you get over there and you help him, boys. He said, what would Clark say if he knew you sitting around somebody working like that? <laughs> so he said, come to the house. Judy's going to fix some sandwiches and stuff for y'all. So instead of going out and hitting the highway and then going north and going back east, he wanted to go straight up this country road. We were going along there and the higher the farther we go the higher the weeds are in the middle of the road pretty soon there's weeds not hitting on the hood as we've been in them over and we was going all over the united states and parts of canada in that truck <laughs> and we come up to this t and i said all right tuffy which way which way now and he's telling these big stories and he looks to the right and he looks to the left and he says where in the hell are we? <laughs> I said, this is your country, not mine. <laughs> he said, you last for me. He said, I'll turn right. <laughs> if you ever crack back out and need a roadie, I'll be there for you, Pake. You mean musically or steer ropingly? Either one. Oh, either one. Cody the roadie. My name Cody rhymes with roadie. it perfectly. <laughs> if it's... If it's music playing, I'll, I'll play backup triangle in the band for you after I'm rodeoing. Now, if you sing backup, will that be way back? <laughs> I ain't singing. I'll just be playing the triangle in the back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the only, that's the only one that I, only only instrument I've mastered hey, so far. Hey, you might want to edit that uh, James Maxwell story out of this deal. All righty. You got it. Now, I don't care. I mean... It don't shock my modesty, I mean, but if it's, I mean, I put it in my book, but you know your deal. Oh, no, no, we're all good. We're all good, Peggy. All right, good, good. We're all good. Good. I mean, they say worse than that on TV, don't they? <laughs> For sure now. <laughs> I can't believe what's on TV nowadays. I, me either. They say things on TV now that you wouldn't hear on Woodstock. Uh-uh. <laughs> Richard Pryor wouldn't say some of the stuff they yeah. say on TV now. Yeah. But anyway, thank you, Pake. We appreciate you doing this with us, and uh, thank you so much for keeping the Western Way of Life alive down here. Oh, you bet. You bet. you guys come back anytime. Thank you. Appreciate are you booking out? Are you booking out any shows right now, Pake? Yes, I do. A, I do a one for electrical electrical cooperative meeting in September in Kingfisher. I'm supposed to do a show in Mineral Wells, Texas, with some guys with the band. And things are starting to loosen up a little bit over the COVID thing, Jimbo. And I don't, it's still here, but it seems like people don't have their fear of it like they used to. Right. If and they want to book you, how would they do it? Call Pake McIntyre, 918-625-5281, or my roadie Cody. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Thanks, Pake. Thank you, Cody. Thank you, Jimbo. Thank you very Jimbo. much. Thank you. See everybody next week right here on uh, Cowboys of the Osage podcast. This is Cody the Roadie. It's been Jimbo and Pake. <laughs> See everybody next week.